This is Infantry Attacks by Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, originally published as Infantry Gereft An. Chapter 4, Combat in the Southeast Carpathians, August 1917. Approach March to the Carpathian Front. Although the outbreak of the Russian Revolution weakened the Allied position on the Eastern Front, the summer of 1917 found large German forces still pinned down in that area. Nothing short of a complete eradication of the entire front would release these forces for the final decision in the West. To this end, the southern flank of the Russo-Romanian front was to be attacked from the south by the 9th Army, which was located between the lower course of the Sereth and the edge of the mountains 20 miles northwest of Fokosny, and from the west by the Garok group, which was in contact to the left of the mountains. Pardon me, the left in the mountains. After a week's train ride in intense summer heat from Kolmar via Heilbronn, Nuremberg, Chemnitz, Breslau, Budapest, Arad, and Kronstadt, the troop train under my command, in brackets, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd companies, arrived in Brez Brezeksk fall, uh, towards noon on August 7th, 1917. We were the next to the last unit of the battalion to arrive. At the station, I learned that the attack by the Garok group was scheduled for the morning of August 8th against the heights on both sides of the Ojtoz Valley. We have here sketch 22. Attack against the Ochchoj Pass, and I am probably butchering that Eastern European name. I do believe it would be Romanian. Okay, so we have... Here, if I understand correctly, the map is facing north. The scale is one inch to two kilometers. Um, marked out in white, here we have the 70th company, it looks like, marked as Honved. Uh, Reinf group as well, marked 15. And Haraj is, appears to be another town. And Honved. So we have uh, 70th, 15th, and 71st companies, and those are marked by an, a white outlined square box with an X in the middle, and two of those appear to have a double X on. Again, there doesn't appear to be any sort of legend for this map, so I can't quite tell offhand what that refers to, but doubtless it will be explained in the following paragraphs. The Reinf group appears to only have a single X marked above it. If I had to infer, perhaps that is to denote the size of these groups in relative terms. And from the looks of it, there is what appears to be a trench line or possibly a other form of fortification. And they are going to be proceeding over that. And it looks like the Reinf group is going to have to go over Hill, one, hill um, 779 through a town called Inguera, uh, Ungurena, and eventually hit Mount Kozna, which is marked as being Hill 788, while the other two groups, the 70th and the 71st, are going to proceed basically on either side, bypassing the hill and passing around the towns of Slanik and Grozesti. But in theory, they should eventually, I guess, meet up on the other side of the mountains. And uh, we'll see how that goes. All right, so that concludes Sketch 22, a ga attack against the Ot-Jaws Pass. Okay. The three companies drew canned rations, and minus baggage took a three-hour truck ride over the Ot-Jaws Pass to Sosmezo, situated near the Hungarian-Romanian border of that time. Our combat gear and provisions were to be sent forward to Sosmezo as soon as they had been unloaded. In Sosmezo we met the valley detachments of the battalion, which had marched to the mountains north of Ojtaz Valley during the forenoon. Telephone connection with battalion headquarters had been interrupted, and a commissary sergeant transmitted the battalion orders orally. Quote, Rommel detachment to follow the battalion as soon as possible to Hill 764, in brackets, 
Bokan via Harja, Hill 1020, end quote. Austrians, Hungarians, and Bavarians occupied the valley in force, and many batteries, some of major caliber, lined both sides of the valley road. Since I could not start the march into the mountains until the combat equipment arrived, I ordered the units to bivouac in a very small area. Austrian sentries with fixed bayonets watched that none of my riflemen got into the local commandant's potato patch. This precaution was justified because of the extreme ration shortage existing at that time. Night fell and the battalion band gave an hour's concert among the campfires. Our memories of the last winter's campaign in Romania caused us to view the future with great confidence. The fires were extinguished at 2200 hours. The troops slept, which was necessary, for the ensuing days would certainly demand the greatest exertions of us. The night's rest was cut short by the arrival of the baggage at midnight. Shortly thereafter, I gave the orders to awake, break camp, issue four days' rations, and get the companies ready for the long march ahead. Since all vehicles were to remain behind in Sosmezo, the companies and the detachment staff were each allotted a few pack animals which they loaded with ammunition, rations, and other kit from our stores. Then the unit began to march via Harja. The column moved forward noiselessly in the clear, warm, moonlit night. By daybreak, I wanted to clear those portions of the valley and Hill 1020 that were presumably under enemy observation. From Harja, the steep and slippery way led mostly through forests. At daybreak, the companies had an opportunity to test their strength by, full, by pulling up the hill, an Austrian howitzer battery, which was to take part in the coming battle. In the course of the forenoon, the artillery of both sides did a great deal of firing. We were afraid we might be late for the breakthrough by the 15th Bavarian Reserve Infantry Brigade, to which the Wertenberg Mountain Infantry Battalion had been attached. In spite of a very fast pace, it was noon before we arrived at the Wooded Hill 764. While the unit was resting, I reported our arrival by telephone to Major Sprosser and received orders to move forward as Brigade Reserve to Hill 672, where Sprosser's headquarters was located. On arrival, I was given the 6th Company and later three additional machine gun companies. Concerning the course of the battle, we learned that the 10th Bavarian Reserve Infantry Regiment had taken the first Romanian positions on the Unguera after a very stiff struggle. The Romanians were said to have fought very bravely there, contrary to all expectations, and to have defended every trench and dugout with extreme tenacity. A breakthrough on the hostile front was not achieved that day. My force was in position for the night, had pitched tents, and was cooking supper when orders came to move further forward with three infantry companies and one machine gun company to a point just west of the Unguera, in brackets Hill 779. Major Sprosser went on ahead and I followed with my four companies. It was pitch dark in the woods as we slogged along in single file over a swampy, narrow footpath. Flares were going up on the ridge ahead of us, machine guns chattered from time to time, and shells burst here and there. We soon reached our destination. I reported our arrival and received orders to camp for the night in the hollows just north of the main trail. The individual leaders had just been assigned their places and tasks, and the unit was still standing in a long line on the narrow path when shells began to strike on the slope to the right and left. Surprise Romanian concentration. On all sides, the flashes of the bursting shells lit up the night. Splinters whistled through the air, and earth and stones rained down upon us. Pack animals broke loose and stampeded into the dark with their loads still on their backs. My infantrymen fell flat on the slope and bore the fire patiently until the ten-minute concentration ceased. Fortunately, we suffered no losses in this engagement. The companies moved rapidly to their assigned places. After the exertions of the day, we slept well on the grassy field, wrapped in overcoats and shelter halves in spite of a sudden onset of heavy rain. 
Attack Against the Ridge Road Bend, August 9th, 1917. A renewed surprise artillery concentration woke us abruptly before daybreak. Lieutenant Hauser, my adjutant, and I bivouacked, sorry, and I had bivouacked just above a small hollow where some shells burst alongside the pack animals tethered there. The latter broke loose and stampeded over us and out into the night. Shell after shell struck about us, several just missing us by a hair's breadth. We waited until the fire began to subside before daring to make the short dash to a hollow which offered us better cover. The hostile fire soon ceased, but this time several men had been wounded by shell fragments and Dr. Lenz had to take care of them. At daybreak, I made my way to the battalion command post and, with hot coffee, restored myself from the night's alarms. Towards 0500 hours, we were ordered to move up the slope on the Unguera to a, on a level with the 18th Bavarian Reserve Regiment and to continue the attack. Under strong harassing fire, we crossed the west slope of the Unguera by moving through communication trenches and by dashing from crater to crater. We felt relieved on reaching the less dangerous wooded southwestern slope of the mountain. On arrival, I was ordered to take the first and second companies and drive the enemy from the small wooded plateau half a mile south of the Unguera summit. First, I established contact with the right of the 18th Bavarian Reserve Infantry Regiment, which had dug in about a hundred yards up the slope during the preceding evening. Unfortunately, I was unable to, to obtain information as to the location of the Romanian positions for no reconnaissance had been made in the direction of the small plateau. For the first time, I was able to examine the terrain over which I was to advance, and I also checked the map thoroughly. A deep ravine lay between us and the plateau, and both were covered with trees and dense underbrush. I sent a sergeant with ten men and a telephone detail out to locate the enemy dispositions, and within fifteen minutes had the report that the strong position on the plateau had been abandoned by the enemy. On receipt of this information, I immediately pushed both companies forward by following the telephone wires in single file and seized the abandoned position and prepared it for an all-around defense. I had to bear in mind that hostile forces coming from any direction might want to reoccupy the well-built installations. When I reported to Major Sprosser, scarcely 30 minutes had elapsed since the assignment of the mission. We have here sketch 23. Situation on August 9th, 1917, viewed from the south. Here we have A, the seizure of the plateau, B, noon rest point, C, location of the afternoon attack, D, the evening position, E, the enemy counterattack, and F, the attack of the 18th Bavarian Infantry Regiment and the Württemberg Mountain Battalion. Very detailed map indeed. Continuing here on the next page. The chief activity during the forenoon was a reconnaissance of the nearly trackless forest region towards the south, in brackets, Ojtaz Valley, and east, which resulted in the capture of two enemy prisoners. We were relieved of the on the plateau at noon by the Hungarian Honved infantry coming up from the west. On orders from the battalion, my detachment, now reinforced by the 3rd Company, was to move off northward through the woods to a position on the high ridge a quarter of a mile southeast of Unguera. We used the same security measures that we had employed that morning, a strong reconnaissance patrol with a telephone detail. Once there, we gained deployment in a hedgehog defensive position with all-around security, since we had no direct contact on either flank, and I wished very much to avoid unpleasant surprises. The enemy was now known to be occupying very strong positions on the main ridge about half a mile east and northeast of Unguera. Following a short artillery barrage, these hostile positions were to be assaulted at 1500 hours and the enemy driven back beyond the bend of the ridge road, the Trasse which was about one mile east of the Unguera. 
the 18th Bavarian Reserve Infantry Regiment was to attack along the line of the ridge with the Wartenberg Mountain Infantry Battalion just to the south. My unit would also have a place in the front line for the attack. While the companies rested and ate in the deep gullies to the west, I sent out several reconnaissance squads to scout the positions which would be attacked in the afternoon. Technical Sergeant Pfeiffer, with ten men, moved out with the southernmost reconnaissance unit to determine whether, where, and in what strength the enemy was occupying the ridge running south from the bend in the ridge road. From the nature of the hostile installation on the plateau, located one half mile south of the Unguera Peak, I concluded that the enemy did not have many well-integrated positions on the slopes farther east. It seemed to me very likely that only the installations on the heights and in the valley were both extensive and interconnected, but that any positions found on the slopes themselves would be few and far between, and indeed probably quite isolated. Here, one could expect to find the weak points in the enemy's defense. Here, for enterprising troops, was the way to quickly and effectively achieve success. Our reconnaissance to the north reported contact with wired-in positions everywhere, while Pfeiffer, within half an hour of his departure, reported the capture of several, pardon me, of 75 Romanians and five machine guns. How was this possible? We had not heard a single shot from that direction. On the telephone, Pfeiffer tersely reported, enemy surprised taking a break with no watch posted in a ravine 600 yards southeast of our detachment campsite. We discovered them while going down, attacked them silently with 10 riflemen, and called on the Romanians to give up. Unarmed, since they had left their weapons to one side, they had no choice but to surrender willy-nilly to our meager ten men. <laughs> I reported Pfeiffer's success to Major Sprosser and suggested that I take my units and break through the non-integrated enemy positions on the southern slope at the same time the frontal attack was being launched against the crest. I further suggested that if a breakthrough could be achieved, we might try a surprise push against the ridge at the south bend of the road. Sorry, at the road bend, not south. I don't know why I said that. I'm going to reread that from the top. I further suggested that a breakthrough could be achieved, and if it could, we might try a surprise push against the ridge at the road bend, which would put us in the rear of the hostile positions one half mile east of Unguera. This could force the enemy to evacuate his entire defensive line between Unguera and the Ridge Road Bend. Major Sprosser passed the proposal on to Brigade Command, and shortly thereafter I was ordered to carry out the proposed attack against the positions on the slope with the 2nd and 3rd Companies. Unfortunately, I was not given any heavy machine guns to achieve this task with. Soon, the unit marched silently down Pfeiffer's telephone line with his squad acting as advanced guard. He had failed to locate any other enemy forces. We descended towards the valley and passed through a heavy forest of deciduous trees and thick underbrush. The slope was steep, and I was obliged to follow Pfeiffer, who led us down into the Ajtaz Valley at a sacrifice of 1,200 feet of elevation. We were barely a hundred yards from the Ajtaz Valley Road when I caught up with Pfeiffer and ordered him to start climbing towards the Ridge Road bend in a northeasterly direction. With Lieutenant Hauser and a few runners, I went forward close behind the point. Pardon me, Lieutenant Hauser. Soon it became apparent that something was wrong, and I hurried forward. In a less dense part of the forest, Pfeiffer pointed to some Romanian sentries about 200 yards away, behind whom we could see the Romanian positions. The enemy was directing his attention to the open terrain on both sides of the valley road. We left them undisturbed, and instead climbed up a narrow path leading through the thickly wooded steep western slope in the direction of the ridge road bend. It was quite obvious that we would run into the Romanian positions during our climb, and I therefore ordered the advanced guard to take cover as soon as contact with the enemy had been made, and to protect the advance of the remainder of the unit. The advanced guard was prohibited from opening fire unless attacked by the enemy. 
My idea was to deceive the Romanians and let them believe that they had run into a reconnaissance detachment, thereby gaining time to complete the ascent and prepare for the attack. By following these precautions, I hope to surprise the Romanians. 500 feet above the floor of the valley, the advanced guard was fired on from a position farther up the slope and, as per order, took cover without returning the fire. I quickly disposed the unit for attack with the third company on the right and the second company on the left. The thick underbrush made it possible to complete our preparations unbeknownst to the enemy. My attack order was, quote, Second company attack astride the narrow footpath. The attack is a feint and must deceive the enemy and pin him down by means of rifle fire and hand grenades. Make full use of cover to avoid casualties. Direction of attack is up the west side of the slope. Simultaneously, the third company envelops the hostile position from the right. I will be with the third company. Some Romanian reconnaissance detachments found their way into our assembly area and forced us to action before we had completed our preparations. They were repulsed and I immediately ordered the second company to attack. The company encountered an occupation position, pardon me, an occupied position 150 meters up the slope. During the ensuing fire and hand grenade battle, the third company and I climbed some 300 feet to the east, passing through thick brush and reaching the enemy flank without meeting any opposition. The enemy was in platoon strength, and his attention was focused on the frontal firefight. Our attack forced him to evacuate his position and retire up the slope. We were unable to pursue because of the dense forest terrain the limited visibility, and the fact that a further advance would have brought us into the second company's field of fire. Therefore, I elected to halt the third company. The second company continued to press the retreating enemy, repeating its former tactics wherever it met increased resistance. The third company did likewise, and the retreating foe scarcely had time to halt and turn before he was driven to ground by the rifle fire and hand grenades of the second company. These renewed outbursts were signals to the third company to start another envelopment on the right. This type of combat, under a burning August sun, called for tremendous exertions on the part of the troops who had to contend with their heavy packs as well as with the steep slope. Several men collapsed from exhaustion throughout the course of the battle. We drove the enemy from five successive positions, each one stronger than its predecessor, until Lieutenant Hasser and I, joined together with ten or twelve men, were the only ones left in pursuit of the enemy. Steady shooting, shouting, and hand, grenade thro hand grenades thrown to one side so that we might avoid their fragments as we charged forward kept the Romanians on the run as they retreated through the undergrowth ahead of us. In this way, we succeeded in driving them back through a developed and apparently continuous position secured by obstacles and prevented them from making a stand. The woods beyond the position were less dense and the hillside, while still leading upwards, became less steep. We reached a forest clearing bordered on the right by long grassy slopes, which would, which we saw, sorry, um, we reached a forest clearing bordered on the right by long grassy slopes, across which we saw two enemy companies retreating in a northeasterly direction towards the crest of the ridge. Over on the right, a Romanian mountain battery with its pack animals was displacing to the rear, trying to reach safety quickly. We opened fire rapidly from the thickets on the retreating enemy, who fortunately was not able to estimate our numbers. When the enemy had disappeared in the nearby woods and in the folds of the terrain, I ordered Lieutenant Hasser to join and continue his pursuit with all the available men. As our mountain troops advanced from the edge of the woods, a Romanian mountain battery on our left flank, located a quarter of a mile away at the northwest corner of the clearing, opened up on us with canister and sent a hail of balls crashing through the woods. We took cover behind large beech trees. Shortly afterward, the first of the second and third companies came gasping breathlessly up the slope, and I moved them to the right into a hollow which offered substantial cover. We have here sketch 24, evening attack of August 9th, 
1917, viewed from the south. Point A is listed as the location of the evening attack. Point B is located here to the farther end of the map and is listed as being the position at night. So we see here the Germans coming in, and I do believe it's viewed from the south, so facing north, in other words. So we see here the Germans moving north through the enemy's fortified position, and they set up a position under, regrettably at least, under the direct fire of enemy artillery. They then have one section that's, you know, as they stated, it as I stated previously, that's basically engaging the enemy, while another section of them swing up and to the right and then continue to engage the enemy as they progress up the hill. And then by the eve time of the evening, they had managed to reach position B. And so that's where they were. Continuing here with the text. We were only a half mile from our attack objective. The crest line near the ridge road bend. The enemy's precipitous retreat called for a continuation of the attack, regardless of the troops' exhaustion. Sounds of heavy combat had been coming from the Nguera for some time. The attack of the Bavarians and the other units of the Werdenberg Mountain Battalion seemed to be making substantial progress. Our further advance towards the crest was barred by rifle and machine gun fire. Even these few moments of respite had given the hostile leaders an opportunity to get their troops in hand and to form a new front. I was handicapped by not having a single machine gun in either company to bring to bear. By taking skillful advantage of the smallest irregularities of the terrain, we succeeded in moving closer and closer to the crest of the hill and to the enemy who lay there, who seemed to be well aware of the importance of his position. Anyone who showed himself drew an immediate burst of rifle and machine gun fire. In this manner, Technical Sergeant Bootler received an ad abdominal wound while observing close beside me. Twilight began to favor our progress. Shortly before the fall of darkness, the Rommel detachment occupied the heights just west of the Romanian crest position, which hitherto had given us so much trouble. Elements of my outfit occupied a small saddle 70 yards from the Romanian machine gun muzzles, but in defilade from them. Here my riflemen deployed themselves on a front facing north and east. Our elements secured the adjacent oak woods on the west, where they had the enemy to the north and west. Of course, Romanian counterattacks tried to drive us from the heights. But lively carbine fire or carbine fire forced the attackers back to their starting positions. Since we had pushed a wedge across the ridge road, contact between the Romanians in positions east and west of us had been broken. The wire line to the battalion, laid with so much effort during the advance and fighting, had been cut, and I was obliged to use pyrotechnic signals to announce our arrival at the objective to the battalion. The detachment was silently reorganized in the darkness, and we dug in, deployed as a hedgehog, since we could expect counterattacks from any direction. I kept a platoon at my disposal in the oak woods close to my command post. We pushed combat outposts forward wherever the situation permitted. We had no contact with the battalion. Apparently, the frontal attack in the afternoon failed to achieve the desired result. Between the Ridge Road Bend, in brackets here, we were about 550 yards east of it, and Unguera, li lively fighting continued to rage. Consequently, we were about 1,100 yards behind the hostile front. So I reckon that'd be slightly over a kilometer. If I, like 1,100 yards, it's 3.28 feet per meter, and it's 3 feet per yard, so that's... I'd say 1.12-ish kilometers, give or take, and I may well have the math wrong, but please bear with me. In a pup tent, I dictated my combat report to Lieutenant Hauser by the glow of a flashlight. Lights could not be shown anywhere without drawing immediate fire. Meanwhile, the mountain soldiers performed an especially valiant deed. Lance Corporal Schumacher 
Second Company, and a comrade carried the seriously wounded Technical Sergeant Bootler in a shelter half down to the Ojtaz Valley, in brackets 1,100 feet difference in elevation. From there, they carried their sergeant during the night to Sosmezo to a doctor who operated immediately and thus saved his life. In the dark night, and considering the difficulties of the terrain and the length of the trip, in brackets, eight miles as the crow flies, this was a tremendous accomplishment, a splendid example of soldierly fidelity. Before the report was finished, I was relieved of the heavy worry regarding the situation at daybreak on August 10th, for a reconnaissance detachment sent out a westerly direction had made contact with elements of the 18th Bavarian Reserve Infantry Regiment. The latter, supported by artillery, had attacked frontally in the afternoon with the other elements of the Wartenberg Mountain Battalion but had been unable to make such headway against the enemy who defended his position most tenaciously. Then, through the noise of fighting and later by the light signals, the success of the attack by the Rommel detachment had become clear to friend and foe alike. To avoid being cut off, the Romanians had evacuated his positions between Unguera and the Ridge Road bend under cover of darkness and had retreated and retired in a northeasterly direction towards the slopes leading down to the Slanic Valley. Before midnight, the combat report was sent by runner to a battalion on the Unguera. At the same time, I ordered a new wire line to be laid. The night was cool, and I was so cold in my sweat-soaked clothes that I got up at 0200 hours and moved about just to keep warm. With Lieutenant Hauser, we, I went to the front line and reconnoitered the hostile position, which lay opposite us to the east on a small wooded height in the so-called Oak Copse, I do believe they mean corpse, about 90 yards away. Since I was forbidden unnecessary shooting because of the supply difficulties, the enemy was most incautious. His sentries marched their posts as if under the most peaceful conditions and were most conspicuous against the eastern horizon, which was becoming lighter as the night wore on. It would have been simple to shoot them, but I wished to defer this to a later time. When it became fully light, we could see that the Romanians to the east were holding a broad front with a nearly continuous line of positions running from Petrai Peak through the oak corpse towards the north. Observations. The fire attack of the Romanian artillery in the night of August 8th and 9th in the area where the Rommel detachment lay in reserve caused a few losses. These losses would have been reduced had the troops dug in. On August 9th, combat reconnaissance by scout squads behind which telephone lines were laid proved excellent in the wood-covered mountains. I could call the scout squads at any time during the advance, get information within a few minutes, and, well, that would certainly be of benefit. Um, I could call the scout squads at any time during the advance, get information in a few minutes, could give orders or recall a part of the squads, or could move along the telephone line of the successful scout squad, quickly advance, and occupy the position with my main body. The runner system, usually time-consuming in the mountains, was avoided. A preliminary condition, to be sure, was an abundant supply of telephone equipment and wire. In the difficult attack in the forest up the steep slope, the enemy, located in a higher position, was deceived as to our main attack by a lively fire, shouting and hand grenades, and was induced to dispose his reserves incorrectly. The thrust by the third company against the flank and rear then led to a quick success. In the same way, five such positions were taken in succession one after another, though the final garrison was two companies strong. The attack followed each other so quickly that the enemy had no time for regrouping. In spite of the enemy's superiority in numbers and armament, the Republicans having numerous machine guns and mountain guns at their disposal, the Rommel detachment, by taking advantage of these smallest irregularities of the terrain, succeeded in capturing and defending the crest of the heights 1,100 yards behind the hostile front. 
The enemy was thus compelled to vacate his positions opposite the 18th Reserve Infantry Regiment and the Wertenberg Mountain Battalion during the night. After a successful attack, the Rommel detachment dug in quickly with all-around security. Without having dug in, it would have suffered heavy losses from hostile fire and from the enemy's counterattacks. Our losses for the night were two dead, five severely wounded, and ten slightly wounded. Attack of August 10th, 1917. Towards 0600 hours on August 10th, telephone communications had been established with the battalion. Through the administrative officer, I learned that Major Sprosser had arrived with the other companies of the Wartenberg Mountain Battalion, and he gave fullest praise to the Rommel Detachment for its conclusive success on August 9th. I then orientated myself to the situation facing the detachment on its eastern front. There, the Romanian sentries behaved incautiously, even in broad daylight. In fact, some units of the Romanian garrison were sunning themselves hard by the positions dug during the night between Petrai Hill and the Oak Corpse. Things were quite different with us. The sentries and garrisons of the Rommel detachment were well concealed and had strict orders not to let themselves be seen anywhere and to shoot only in case of a hostile attack. The hostile positions stretched from the bare western slopes of the Petrai, in brackets Hill 693, along the ridge rising towards the Oak Corpse. The ridge had only a few clumps of bushes on it. The Oak Corpse itself seemed to be strongly fortified. It commanded the area towards the south, west, and north. North of the Oak Corpse, the enemy positions extended valleywards through the undergrowth towards the deep gorge of the Slanic and that, that we mean Sladic Valley. The positions consisted of individual nests and larger strong points, all mutually supporting which dominated the bare slopes to their front. We have here Sketch 25. Uh, sketch 25, Attack on the Ridge Road Bend, August 10th, 1917. So we have here the Bavarians on the left-hand side, and that in this case would be the westerly side of the map because the map faces north and we're viewing from above. So on the west we have the Bavarians and the something marked as W, it doesn't actually say. Um, on the northernmost point of this map we have Picorul Hill or Hill 652. Um, Mount Kozna is on the north easterly side of the map and is marked as Hill 788. The Oak Corpse is just to the west of, well, pardon me, the southwest of Hill 674, although evidently this Oak Corpse does seem to be part of a hill as well, the difference being that the Bavarians are roughly the same height as it at present, judging by the sort of lay of the land drawn out with the various sort of uh, height lines on here. Um, in the southeasterly side of the map, we have Grodzesti, the town, and just in lead of that, we have Pratry Hill, or Hill 693. Uh, there's another hill also near there, Hill 347, and there does in fact appear to be a large group of cliffs, like sheer cliffs, just to the southeast of Hill 674, between Mount Kozna and Petrai Hill. In any case, continuing now with the text. According to the brigade orders, which arrived shortly after 0700 hours, the mountain battalion was to continue the attack and seize the, and seize the bend in the road 400 yards west of Hill 674. Once again, the enemy had to be driven from his positions. This attack was to be made without artillery support, for our guns had insufficient time to displace forward. Major Sprosser detailed me to prepare and execute this maneuver, and gave me the 1st, 3rd, and 6th Mountain Companies, as well as the 2nd and 3rd Machine Gun Companies to work with. This gave me command of a sizable force. My plan of attack was to strike the unsuspecting enemy suddenly with machine gun fire towards noon force the hostile garrisons located in the area 400 yards south to 300 yards north of the Oak Corpse to take cover, pin them down, and, at the same time, 
break through in the region of the Oak Corpse with some of my units, roll the enemy back close to the left and right of the Oak Corpse, and block him off. With these organizations and operations accomplished, I plan to take my main force and, in a single push, break through the fight uh, break through and fight my way to Hill 674. The preparations were tiresome and time-consuming. During the forenoon, I personally concealed ten heavy machine guns, moving them into their positions by wide detours so as to avoid hostile observation. Some were emplaced on the wooded crest of the heights close behind our forwardmost line, and the remainder were in the rills and folds of the southern slope. I assigned targets to each gun and planned the fire schedules to be followed before, during, and after the attack. I set the opening of fire for 1200 hours, so noon, and designated the platoon located nearest the ridge road bend as the base platoon. The remaining units of the Rommel detachment finished their operations towards 1100 hours. And I selected the south edge of the Oak Corpse as the breakthrough site. The depression 90 yards southwest of the Oak Corpse was being filled silently with assault troops, namely of the 3rd, 1st, and 6th companies, and a heavy machine gun company as well. I issued orders and instructions to the assault team, in brackets 3rd company, to the elements of the 3rd company which were to make the feint, and to my main attack force. We have here sketch 26, fire plan for the heavy machine guns in the attack of August 10th, 1917, viewed from the south. So we have here the three, I see three separate heavy machine guns, and they've been kind of, oh sorry, pardon me, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight separate machine guns, and they've been kind enough to show in sort of a V formation the likely range of fire at which they will be leveled in order to ensure infilating fire across the battlefield in various locations between the multiple guns. So we have in the so in the in the western side of the map here, we have it says B N C P. So that's or no, pardon me, that's third. That's a typo there. Or it's either that or it's very hard to read. But I do believe that's third company. Uh, or is CP is the command post. So I guess third companies with... No, no, third companies up in... I, I read it the right the first time, pardon me. BNCP, although it doesn't actually say what that is, because again, the legend on this map, and that's due, so, uh, due west on this map in the trees, hidden in behind. And CP is going to be the command post, so that's presumably where Rommel himself is located. Fourth company and fifth company are just south of the command post, also hidden away in the trees. Second company, sixth company, first company, third company, and the heavy machine gun company are forward of the trees and set up in such a way that they can basically organize and manage themselves fairly well, with the heavy machine gun company in lead at the very front and ready to move. The other heavy machine guns are presumably set up in stationary positions and not intended to move forward with any degree of efficiency during this course of the battle. But if they wanted to do so, they could hypothetically use some of the troops from 4th or 5th Company to achieve that end, or even 2nd Company in the case of the center block there. As for the enemy, we have what appears to be an enemy trench line or other fortified position, very little in the way of other detail denoted on the map itself. All right, continuing here. Mail arrived 10 minutes before the attack and was quickly and quietly distributed. Punctually, at 1200 hours, or high noon, I gave the base machine gun platoon the prearranged signal for opening fire. A few seconds later, all 10 heavy machine guns were in action with particular concentration of fire on the Oak Corpse. In order to mislead the enemy and to cause hasty commitments on his part, the left flank platoon of the third company shouted as loudly as possible simultaneously with the opening of the machine gun fire and threw numerous hand grenades into the northwestern corner of the oak corpse. All of this was done from cover in order to keep losses to a bare minimum. The Romanians were not slow in answering our fire. 
Amid the ear-splitting roar and the partial concealment offered by the smoke and fumes of exploded hand grenades drifting towards them, the assault troops of the 3rd Company now stormed forward to traverse the 100 yards from just behind the ridge road to the southwest corner of the Oak Corpse. The heavy machine guns, which from the rear had given the enemy positions a good pounding, were now ordered to train their fire to the left and to the right, leaving a fire-free zone for the storming party. My staff and I followed closely in behind the assault troops who were silently advancing, on the double, and were determined to finish the job at hand. The remainder of 3rd Company, with a heavy machine gun platoon, were hard on our heels. There was great banging and shooting on all sides. Scarcely two minutes had elapsed since we opened fire, and our heavy machine guns were still hammering away when we heard the sounds of a savage battle on the left near the Ridge Road. At the same time, our assault force broke into the Oak Corpse and encountered their first serious resistance in the enemy trenches. Our mountain troops made short work of this. Where their advance was held up, they simply abandoned cover and charged the enemy position headlong. They were given admirable support by the machine gun platoons which had reached the edge of the Oak Corpse, quickly set up, and directed their fire from the left to pin down the enemy just in front of the assault group. One of my staff orderlies put a shot through the head of a Romanian on my left, aiming at me from a distance of 50 feet. No sooner, no sooner were we in position and in possession of the Oak Corpse than the enemy launched a strong counterattack from the northeast. None of our heavy machine guns had yet been properly situated forward, and those back at the start line could not be brought forward to bear on the reverse slope to the northeast in time. The enemy was soon within hand grenade range, and a furious carbine and grenade fight ensued, in which the staff also had to use their weapons. Although the foe was superior in numbers, we fought stubbornly to hold the ground gained. Minutes later, one of our heavy machine guns got into firing position, and the tide soon turned in our favor. I could then get back to my duty of commanding the detachment. Elements of the 3rd Company and a heavy machine gun platoon secured the section of the corpse in our possession to the north and south. I assigned my remaining forces, 1st and 6th Companies, as well as the elements of both machine gun companies made available by our successful breakthrough. In brackets, that. The mission of breaking through along the ridge in the direction of Hill 674. Sorry, I'm going to reread that entire paragraph. I assigned my remaining forces, in brackets, 1st and 6th Company, as well as the elements of both machine gun companies made available by our successful breakthrough. The, I assigned them the mission of breaking through along the ridge in the direction of Hill 674. While some heavy machine gun positions pinned the enemy down to his positions on both sides of the Oak Corpse until un other units blocked the shoulders of the breach in the hostile position, thus allowing the main body to storm the ridge, regardless of strong fire on all sides. Hill 674 was our sole objective, and we advanced in a column of companies, first company leading the way at a brisk pace. We have here sketch 27 with um, map facing west. All right, sketch 27, attack towards Hill 674, viewed from the west, pardon me. So if you're standing on a hill facing east, and that means north is to your left on this map, and south is to your right. And due east, we have Mount Kozna, in we have brackets, we have 788 M, so that that could be meters above, and again, be, as I say, the original terrain and maps and all the rest were written in, in, I'm assuming, metric, and then they would have switched to imperial when this book was adapted to English for the American audience, so that is almost certainly saying that Mount Kozna is a hill, or that portion of Mount Kozna relative to the area where they are now is 788 meters higher than them, so not insubstantial. Um, we have on the northern side of the map Pickle Rule, which I do believe is a town or something of some kind. And we have here BNCP, so then CP again, the command post. And we have three heavy machine gun positions in front of the command post. And the northernmost one appears to be 
breaching the enemy line and approaching towards Mount Kozna using dead ground for fire where they can't be fired upon. So like there's little thickets here and there and they'll basically charge for towards that area of cover, set that set up and then do it again and again and again until eventually the enemy position is taken. Without meeting any resistance, leading elements of the first company soon reached a small knoll a quarter of a mile west of Hill 674. I was close behind them and was just crossing a small depression when I was forced to hit the dirt by a burst of machine gun fire coming from our right. The bullets dug small holes in the turf and their source seemed to be a slope some 900 yards southeast of Hill 674. Pardon me nearly 1,300 yards away. I had only pitiful cover behind a small mound, and I intended to dash on when the machine gun fire lifted suddenly. Suddenly, I received a bullet from behind in the left forearm, and the blood spurted forth. Looking around, I discovered a detachment of Romanians firing upon me and a few men of the first company from some bushes about 90 yards behind us. In order to get out of this dangerous field of fire, I made a zigzag dash to the knoll in front of us where some elements of the first company had to defend themselves for about ten minutes until the Romanians to the west had been taken care of in hand-to-hand -hand fighting by the men following us. The French officer commanding the Romanian unit kept shouting, KILL THE GERMAN DOGS, until he took a bullet at close range. Farther back, violent fighting had also developed. The Romanians had recovered from their initial fight, pardon me, their initial fright, and were trying to recapture their lost sectors by means of counterattacks with local reserves. The decision was ours, thanks to the incomparable bravery of all the mountain riflemen and the energy of the officers. The first and sixth companies took Hill 674 without encountering further resistance. Meanwhile, my arm was bandaged by Dr. Lenz. Then I ordered my unit to occupy the captured territory and to reorganize as needed. The order was, quote, the 6th Company to re is to be reinforced by Aldinger's heavy machine gun platoon on Hill 674. All other units at my disposal in the broad hollow just north of the ridge rode 400 yards west of Hill 674. In spite of severe pain and exhaustion through loss of blood, I did not give up command of the unit. Major Sprosser was informed of our success by telephone. About this time, a long column was seen marching towards us on the ridge road from the direction of Mount Kozna. So we organized the defense accordingly, and the spade came into its own. I urgently requested artillery fire on approaching hostile forces, but this request could not be fulfilled as all artillery units were displaced forward. Pardon me, displacing forward. The enemy drew nearer, unhindered. Captain Gosler arrived with the remaining companies of the Wernberg Mountain Battalion, and we split the command. The Rommel detachment consisted of the 5th and 6th Companies and Aldinger's Machine Gun Platoon as frontline garrison, and the 2nd and 3rd Companies and the 3rd Machine Gun Company as second-line garrison. Gosler was given the 1st and 4th Companies, as well as the 1st Machine Gun Company. His detachment was dug in some 300 yards west of Hill 674, just south of the Ridge Road. Contrary to expectations, the Romanian infantry approaching from the direction of Mount Kozna did not counterattack our new line in the vicinity of Hill 674. They merely contended themselves with feeling out our positions with strong reconnaissance detachments, which were easily repulsed. Following this, the Romanians occupied the ridge opposite the 5th and 6th companies. Their position was half a mile away and was some 2,200 yards long. Under these circumstances, there was no need for us to increase the frontline garrison. The 5th and 6th companies together had a front of about 700 yards with their open flank curved to the rear. Gosler's detachment was in contact with the 6th Company and provided security on the southern slope while the remaining units of my detachment provided security for the northern flank of the 5th Company. The entire defense area in the captured sector was further secured by a system of combat outposts in considerable depth. About 1,500 
hours, sorry, at around 1500 hours, so 3 p.m., the Romanians withdrew from the line extending from the western slopes of Petrai Hill through the Oak Corpse to the west bank of the Slanik. Nevertheless, it was impossible for us to make contact with our neighbors to the right and left. Violent Romanian artillery fire began and soon destroyed the wire connections, denied all movement to runners, and cut up the terrain on both sides of the ridge road between the Oak Corpse and Hill 674. The telephone connections with the 5th and 6th companies were repaired repeatedly, a difficult and dangerous task for the wire details. The fire persisted during the entire afternoon with undiminished violence. Fortunately, the companies upward, forward and the reserve areas were not seriously inconvenienced. In the late afternoon, the Austrian artillery made itself felt. Among other things, a 305 millimeter shell struck in the midst of a group of men, in brackets as it later turned out, a group of Romanian and French officers, on Mount Kozna's summit, which was a very fortunate eventuality. Fortunately indeed, my detachment's losses during the attack and the subsequent artillery bombardment were very low. During the bombardment, I prepared my combat report on the action Oak Corpse Hill 674 in my command post located on the steep slope 400 yards west of Hill 674. The hostile artillery fire did not stop until dark when our pack train came up with rations and ammunition. I was exhausted by loss of blood, and the tightly bandaged arm and overcoat thrown over my shoulders hampered every movement. I was considering giving up the command, but the detachment's difficult position prompted me to remain at my post for the time being. Additional troops were, under, were put under Major Sprosser's command. His command post was in the Oak Woods, 2200 yards southwest of Hill 674. There, too, were the reserves of the Sprosser Group, in brackets units of the 18th Bavarian Infantry Regiment, and the observation posts of the Artillery Liaison Officers. Night fell. Observations. The attack by the Rommel Detachment on August 10, 1917, against the commanding fortified R uh, Romanian position had to be carried out without artillery or mortar support. Only heavy machine guns were available to support the attack. The attack was successful and cost little in the way of casualties because, first and foremost, we had prepared a heavy concentration of machine gun fire on that point in the hostile position where the 3rd Company's assault team was to break through. And second, we succeeded in pinning the enemy down with machine gun fire both during and after the initial assault. On August 10th, the Romanians did not make the mistake of the preceding day, when they neglected the position on the slope. A breakthrough into the hostile position halfway up the slope would have promised little success on August 10th since the terrain was open and such an attack could easily be blocked off by machine gun fire from the heights round about. The enemy had to be tackled along the ridge itself. Battle Reconnaissance Sharp observation of the hostile territory yielded excellent results during the night of August 10th and in the first hours of the morning. The forward hostile installations and the behavior of the garrisons were accurately ascertained. Scout squads were not sent out by us in order not to arouse the enemy and make him curious as to our attack preparations. The enemy, however, committed the gravest mistake of not surveying the terrain in front of his position and, in fact, behaved in a most unwarlike manner, in brackets, visible sentries, garrisons outside of their shelters, etc. Thus, our surprise attack struck him like a thunderbolt. The assault team of the 3rd Company had a path to the Oak Corpse prepared by several heavy machine guns which covered the enemy in the Oak Corpse with combined fire from positions 200 yards west of the breakthrough site, and then shifted their fire to the right and left so that the advancing squad of the 3rd Company was not endangered. In the further course of the attack, the same heavy machine guns admirably supported the rolling up of the hostile positions by laying their fire close in front of their own assault teams. 
The feint 100 yards to the left of the breakthrough point, delivered from complete concealment with hand grenades and shouting, was to draw the defensive fire of the enemy in the Oak Corps in a false direction and to bring about the premature commitment of reserves. It fully achieved its purpose in helping the assault team forward without producing any losses on our part. To be sure, the enemy quickly and skillfully delivered a counter-thrust from the northeast against our breakthrough in the Oak Corps, but the superior fighting ability of the mountain riflemen also proved itself in the defense. The Romanians had occupied the crest of the heights to the rear of the continuous position with reserves, but the latter were, for the most part, ill-prepared to react against our surprise breakthrough, and were overrun in their dugouts. Wherever they took up the defense or counterattacked, they were quickly overwhelmed by the greater strength of the mountain soldiers. For five companies advanced through the breach to be followed by the Gassier detachment and four more companies. Thus, the surprise attack had the necessary power. After seizing the objective, we went over to the defense. The companies on the front line dug in with good concealment. The open flanks on the north and south were secured by combat outposts from the reserve company. It was not advisable to send out scout squads to greater distances. They might easily be shot or captured by the garrisons of rearward Romanian positions. On the other hand, the hostile territory was most thoroughly studied from the various observation posts. Shortly after reaching the objective, our troops vacated the ridge between the Oak Corps and Hill 674. They had dug in laterally on the irregularities of the terrain, and the very heavy hostile artillery fire in the afternoon did little harm to us. The attack of the Rommel detachment along the ridge forced the enemy to evacuate his beached, his breached position in the afternoon and to withdraw to a new position thereafter. The hostile command was not very active, limiting itself to nothing more than defense and not daring to launch a resolute counterattack, although numerous reserves and strong artillery were at hand. And the terrain to the north would have been, like that in the south, most favorable for such a counterattack. The Storming of Mount Kozna, August 11th, 1917. The front remained quiet and we were not even bothered by Romanian scout squads. Towards 2200 hours, Major Sprosser informed me that the brigade had ordered an attack with artillery support against Mount Kozna for 1100 hours the next day, and was asking for suggestions. Judging from the terrain, an attack from the west and northwest seemed most promising to me, for here, the highest parts of the mountain ridge were not wooded and artillery and heavy machine gun support would be easily secured. Moreover, the numerous folds of the terrain north of the ridge road offered good avenues of approach for the attacking troops. Major Sprosser then requested me to remain with him an additional day in spite of my wound, and to take over the command of the group attacking from the west and northwest namely the 2nd, 3rd, 5th, and 6th Mountain Companies, the 3rd Machine Gun Company, and the 1st Machine Gun Company of the 11th Reserve Infantry Regiment, which were then assigned to me. At the same time, the Southern Attack Group under Captain Gosler, in brackets 1st and 4th Mountain Companies, 1st Machine Gun Company, 2nd and 3rd Battalions of the 18th Bavarian Reserve Infantry Regiment, was to attack Mount Kozna from the south or southwest via Hill 647 and Hill 692. The new and difficult task was most attractive, so I remained with the outfit. We have here Sketch 28 which is listed as being attack plan for August 11th of 1917. So here on this map, it is apparently viewed from above with the topmost portion being north. From the west, here we see Rommel's detachment heading east, and they are proceeding towards Mount Kozna, which is also listed as Hill 788 on this map. Meanwhile, Gosler's detachment moves through a what looks to be a valley between basically Mount Petrai, which is listed as Hill 693, and a very steep cliff, which is on the edge of Mount Kozna. So they're proceeding, that is to say, Gosler's detachment 
is proceeding between Mount Petrai and Mount Kozna towards Hill 347 in order to mount Hill 692 and meet, and meet Rommel's detachment at the peak of Mount Kozna at whatever time possible. In the southeasterly portion of the map, we have Grozesti, the town, again listed. And as for the scale of this map, one inch to 300 meters. Continuing here. I got little sleep during the night because my wound smarted and my nerves were on edge as a result of the day's activities, not to mention my preoccupation with the next day's work. Before daybreak, I woke Lieutenant Hasser and we went forward to the 5th and 6th companies and, in the early morning light, studied the terrain and prepared our attack plans. The enemy positions were astride the ridge road on the next ridge half a mile to the east of our forward positions. His sentries were hidden behind trees or in the undergrowth. North of the road, we located a fairly compact skirmish line in recently dug positions. Elements of the garrison stood in groups. Neither side disturbed the quiet of daybreak with shots. Our positions were well concealed and scarcely perceptible to the enemy. The avenue of approach Pardon me, the avenues of approach were less favorable than I had originally envisioned. Bare grassy slopes in front and to the south offered <coughs> bare grassy slopes in front and to the south offered no protection against hostile fire. The terrain seven to nine hundred yards north of the ridge road appeared more favorable. On the grassy slopes of the ridge leaning leading to the Picloru uh, Pic Picky Pikiol Ru, uh, numerous, fairly large and dense clumps of bushes were scattered about. The Pikiol Ru, in brackets Hill 652, located a mile north of the ridge road on the flank of the 5th Company, was covered with large deciduous trees. Sharp and dominating, the Mount Kozna summit loomed on the horizon in the rays of the rising sun. It was the objective for the attack on August 11th. Would we be able to do it? We had to. My wounded arm was forgotten, for I had six companies to lead against the enemy. I went about the difficult and responsible work with confidence and newfound strength and vigor. I planned to use the companies already in position to pin the enemy down starting at 0800 hours, to mislead him and prevent him from reconnoitering the ravines northwest of his positions. During the course of the morning, I would move the bulk of the assault force south on the Picolru, using the thick brush there for concealment, to within storming distance of the enemy position north of the ridge road. Once in position, I expected to attack with artillery support at 1100 hours, hoping to breach the position and drive through to Mount Kozna in a single movement. The units located on Hill 674 were to launch a frontal attack co uh, co it says co coincidental, they should say coinciding, but they say coincidental, with ours. Likely a translation error. The 5th and 6th companies, with Aldinger's machine gun platoon, were given to Lieutenant Jung, or Jung, who, in, who I instructed... <sighs> The 5th and 6th Companies, with Aldinger's machine gun platoon, were given to Lieutenant Jung, whom I instructed through Lieutenant Hauser to my plan and the task of his formation in the attack on Mount Kozna. I left Lieutenant Hauser with Jung's detachment in order to secure communication with the Sprosser group and cooperation from the artillery. At 0600 hours, I moved off to the north through dense shrubbery with the remaining four companies. Telephone wire with Jung's combat group was laid at the same time. After about 700 yards, I turned the head of the column eastward, and we approached the ridge between Hill 674 and the Picolru by climbing up a shallow draw. The ridge was sparsely covered with lone trees and clumps of bushes. Now and again, we halted and studied the terrain, and I was amazed to see that the enemy had combat outposts along the entire ridge. The Romanians had pushed combat outposts out in front of their new position. Neither the 5th Company, on, whom I, on whose left flank the outposts were located, nor the scout squads of the reserve companies had located these outposts as yet. 
Under these conditions, a surprise attack from the northwest against the Romanian main position seemed virtually impossible. If I overran the hostile outposts, then the enemy in the main position east of Hill 674 would be alerted and my attack would no longer be a surprise, which would materially reduce the prospects for success. We halted concealed from hostile view to judge the situation. Thorough consideration of the terrain roundabout led me to decide to outwit the combat outposts in front of us. We retraced our steps and, after going a short distance, turned to the north and reached the dense zone of woods on the northwest slope of the Picolru without encountering the enemy. Again, we turned to the east and moved through the dense underbrush on the tall forests towards the Romanian combat outposts. I organized my own security in greater depth. Far in front, an especially skillful technical sergeant of the 3rd Company was scouting and I directed him by means of arm signals and low-pitched calls. Upon my request, his platoon leader, Lieutenant Hummel, was carrying his heavy pack on his own shoulders. I marched a few yards behind the technical sergeant, followed by the remaining ten men of the advanced guard who marched at ten pace intervals. The four companies followed in single file, 160 yards behind the advanced guard. This distance was so arranged that when my signal halted the advanced guard, the companies could continue the march without giving telltale sounds of their advance. Naturally, absolute quiet prevailed in the whole detachment, which was in column about half a mile long. Each soldier avoided making the slightest noise. The troops knew that it was a matter of moving unobserved through the hostile combat outposts. We halted and resumed the march on signal. By listening for some minutes, we succeeded in determining the location of two Romanian outposts. The hostile sentries talked, cleared their throats, coughed, and whistled as we approached yard by yard. The hostile sentries were at 100 to 150 yard intervals, but we could not see them because of the dense underbrush. I moved with the advanced guard to the middle of a gap between two hostile sentries. We were on a level with them and held our breaths. The enemy to the right and left did not diminish his conversation, and I carefully moved the four companies through. At the same time, a telephone line to Jung's combat group was being laid. This line also connect connected us with the command post of the Sprosser group. The adjacent enemy was most unobservant. Always slipping through dense undergrowth, we reached the north slope of the Picolru in the rear of the Romanian sentries and field outposts who were still observing the front to the west. Meanwhile, on the right, and according to our plans, Jung had opened with rifle and machine gun fire. A very deep ravine still separated us from the main Romanian position, and we had to negotiate this obstacle unobserved. In descending, we crossed several paths, but fortunately we encountered no Romanians. Up on the right, near Hill 674, Romanian artillery was plastering Jung's position with heavy fire. The Romanians apparently suspected preparations for attack there, and were taking measures to forestall it. Climbing on the steep slopes in a blazing August sun with the heavy pack, in brackets, the heavy machine gunners carried loads of almost 110 pounds on their backs, was a terrific exertion. It was nearly 1100 hours when we reached the lowest point of the ravine and began to climb the abrupt rocky slope, sparsely covered with tall pine trees on the other side. We proceeded slowly as the terrain caused great difficulties for us. Our, our, our artillery opened its preparatory fire at 1100 hours sharp. To be sure, it seemed rather weak to us and did not strike in the region we were planning to attack. The volume of fire from 5th and 6th companies increased and we answered by enemy artillery. Sorry, and was answered by enemy artillery. During this period, we bent every effort in climbing the slope as hastily as possible within while maintaining silence. My wounded arm hampered my climbing very much, and my combat orderlies had to help me over the more difficult spots along the path. 
Our own artillery fire had ceased when, towards 11.30 hours, the technical sergeant of the 3rd Company, who was out ahead as, as scout, was fired upon in a light forest and, as instructed, quickly took cover without returning the fire. I ordered the advanced guard to halt and secure the ascent of the companies who came up silently until they reached a narrow space on the projecting slope about 160 feet below the advancing the advanced guard. While this was going on, I got Jung on the telephone and told him I intended to attack in half an hour. I also tried to get in touch with Major Sprosser and ask for artillery support, but the wire went dead before I had the opportunity. Apparently, the Romanian detachments on the Picolru had discovered the wire and cut it. That the connection with the Sprosser group, the artillery, and the Young combat group should give out just before the decisive attack, sorry, that the connection with the Sprosser group, the artillery, and the Young combat group should give out just before the decisive attack was most unpleasant. To restore, to restore communication seemed barely possible under the circumstances and would take hours of hard work. Therefore, I had to accept this misfortune and make do. The location of the enemy position which we were to attack could only be surmised. I believed it to be in the region where the scout had been shot at by the Romanian sentries. The configuration of the slope and the growth of bushes and high ferns made it possible to assemble a, in a well-concealed area within rushing distance of the enemy. Support of the attack by machine gun fire from elevated positions was out of the question. Nor could Jung cover our front with fire, for we had no communication whatsoever with him, but I hope he would act according to his instructions. I took one platoon of the 3rd Company and Grau's Machine Gun Company and disposed them in the front line on a width of some 100 yards. The second company was echelon to the right, rear, and the remaining two platoons of the 3rd Company and the 1st Machine Gun Company of the 11th Reserve Infantry Regiment were echeloned to the left rear. We have here Sketch 29. Preparations for the attack of August 11th, 1917, viewed from the west. In other words, uh, north is to the left on this map, south is to the right. We are facing due east, and we are on the westerly side of the map. So here we have what looks to be a line of either enemy wire or enemy trenches. And we have the 1st um, Machine Gun Platoon, 3rd Machine Gun Company, Grau's Machine Gun Company... 2nd Company, 3rd Company, and a machine gun company held with the 11th Reserve Regiment. And A is marking a hand grenade squad, apparently, which is on the northernmost side of the map, and they can be seen lobbing grenades at the enemy. Also note that all the machine guns that are put forward have infiltrating fire within range of the enemy trench line or other defensive position. But yeah, at the moment it looks like 2nd Company, 3rd Company, and um, Machine Gun Company, uh, pardon me, 11th Machine Gun Company are all held in reserve. In any case, my attack order was, quote, On my signal, the forward line, in brackets 1st Platoon of the 3rd Company and Grau's Machine Gun Company, are to creep forward silently through the ferns towards the assumed position up on the slope. As soon as hostile sentries or the garrison opens fire, Grau's machine gun company combs the hostile position with continuous fire of all guns and stops on my signal after 30 seconds. At this moment, the platoon of the third company and the other units of the detachment, which have to be kept close or uh, have to be kept closed up, break in in on the hostile position without shouting. Individual squads block the shoulders of the breach immediately, and the main body breaks through to the defensive zone of the enemy and seizes the ridge as initial objective and prepares to advance to the southeast, to deceive the enemy as to our place of breakthrough and to disperse his effective fire. The sectors of the hostile position on both sides of the breakthrough point are to be engaged by hand grenade squads. All these preparations and discussions were carried out noiselessly within a hundred yards of the hostile sentries. Since I had left Lieutenant Hasser with the 5th and 6th companies, I was obliged to do all the work myself. Hmm. 
We were ready for a few, we were ready a few minutes before noon. The Romanians had done us the favor of not disturbing us during this process. On the eastern slope of the Picolru, the Romanian detachments of platoon size were crossing the path by which we had advanced. It was high time to attack, and I gave the signal. The detachment worked its way up the slope, only to be fired upon immediately from enemy positions near at hand. The enemy fire was quickly answered by all the machine guns in Grau's company. Hand grenades burst to the right and left as we lay ready to charge. The heavy machine gun fire in front of us pinned the hostile garrison to the ground and left the enemy firing wildly from the right and left. I gave the signal to stop the heavy machine gun fire and the mountain troops stormed up the slope, broke into the hostile position without any real losses, took a few captives, blocked off the area, and then charged forward to the right into the defensive zone. Everything went with the clock-like precision of a peacetime maneuver. Soon the bushes in front of us began to thin out, and we advanced across another hundred yards before lively machine gun fire hampered our advance against a slope rising gently to the right. The fire, coming from a wood located on the highest hill about 600 yards away across a broad, grassy surf a surface, increased in violence. The platoon of the 3rd Company and the heavy machine gun of Grau's company took up the fight, and the remainder of the 3rd Company and the machine gun company of the 11th Reserve spread themselves out to the left. The enemy on the edge of the wood was being reinforced, and we were soon engaged with several dozen machine guns. There was no question of continuing the advance across the grassy, unprotected area, for, in our tired condition, we were having trouble holding our own. Hostile reserves counterattacked from the woods with artillery support and made their main effort against our left. The mountain soldiers clung desperately to the ground. They did not want to give way, and their rapid fire stopped the hostile counterattack. We have here sketch 30. Situation at Mount Kosna, August 11th, 1917, viewed from the west. So here we can see what looks to be some sort of... Okay, this is intriguing, actually. I had, They appear to be moving towards Mount Kosna, and yet they've managed to get between the enemy positions somehow, I guess. So third company looks to be engaging some enemy machine guns in fairly close quarters, and second company is engaging the back of the trench line that they managed to buy, like work their way around before, I guess. And the command post looks to be in between what appears to be either an enemy trench line or a string of wire and the enemy's position. Um, fifth company and sixth company went around the enemy trench line and are proceeding towards Mount Kosna. There's also this wooded area where the enemy seems to be located, more or less, and the German troops are more or less sort of jumping from these little thickets to thickets, using them as dead ground to avoid getting caught in the open. Also, 5th and 6th companies appear to be crossing what looks like farmland, or maybe just that's supposed to resemble grass. I can't fully tell, to be frank. Um, also, 3rd company, we can see them lobbing grenades on the northern side of the map. So... Again, this is interesting and very helpful in depicting what's going on, but I strongly wish they had a proper legend on these maps, and the fact that they don't is kind of infuriating. Anyway, continuing here. More and more enemy machine guns began to hammer us, and our losses began to mount at an alarming rate, with the result that our predicament grew more perilous with each passing second. I was up in front on the right of the third company. On the left, Albrecht's heavy machine gun platoon was engaged in most violent combat. The second company was in reserve to the right rear of the bushes where it was protected from hostile fire. Should I commit my reserve? Would its firepower turn the tide of battle in our favor? No. Should I order a withdrawal? No. For then our dead and wounded would have been left in enemy hands, and we would have been driven from this position down into the ravine where the Romanians would have annihilated us with ease. The situation seemed desperate, but we had to master it or remain on the spot. There was some clump of bushes down the slope to our right. 
the idea occurred to me that we might use these as cover uh, uh, to cover in advance against the enemy on the hill, and I decided to commit my last reserves in a surprise blow against the left flank of the enemy who was pressing us so hard. This move could draw decide the issue. I gave instructions to those nearest, nearest me and clawed back, and in a few seconds, the second company and I were rushing impetuously to the south. Pardon me, impetuously to the south. It was a case of do or die. We overran a weak enemy in the clumps of bushes before we knew what had hit them, before he knew what had hit them, and in no time we had gained more than a hundred yards of ground. We turned eastward, and I hoped and prayed that the remainder of the detachment was continuing to actively resist. It was just about, I was just about to launch the attack against the hostile flank when elements of Jung's group appeared on the right rear of the second company. Jung was continuing the ex execution of his mission on the morning and was about to attack the enemy astride the ridge road. His arrival decided the battle in our favor, for the enemy had committed his entire forces against the third company and the two machine gun companies and had nothing left to throw against the attack of three mountain companies and against attack and against his... I'm going to reread that sentence. His arrival decided the battle in our favor. For the enemy had committed his entire forces against the third company and the two machine gun companies, and he had nothing left to throw against the attack of three mountain companies face he was facing against his flank and rear. The Romanians hastily vacated the heights, leaving the greater part of their machine guns on the battlefield abandoned. On the edge of the wood, 700 yards east of Hill 674, the exemplary brave Lieutenant Jung, a leader respected by his company, received a fatal abdominal wound. The third company and second companies, as well as elements of the machine gun companies, continued to fire on the enemy as he slept back as he swept back in complete disorder along the ridge road and through the broad hollow. At the same time, I took the 5th and 6th companies and pursued the enemy just south of the ridge road and across the highest part of the ridge. The other units of the Rommel detachment received orders by runner to follow the same route as soon as possible. While the 6th company took possession of the knoll half a mile west of Mount Kozna's summit, we called it Headquarters Knoll, the 5th Company was bagging more than 200 prisoners in protected, hostile positions west and south of the Ridge Road, and was capturing several enemy machine guns in the running. A broad ravine still separated us from Mount Kozna itself. Dense masses of Romanians were retreating on the road leading down the western slope, and they were soon being hit by fire from the 6th Company. Romanian troops were standing on the summit of Mount Kozna, and we began to see receive lively machine gun fire and rifle fire from there. During this fire, among others, my splendid adjutant, Hauser, received a chest wound. Soon the companies arrived one after the other on headquarters knoll. They were completely exhausted, and no wonder, for since 0600 hours they had been marching, climbing difficult terrain, or attacking the enemy. The enemy occupied prepared positions on the steep height of Mount Kozna and could not have been attacked with exhausted troops. My decision was to rest the men and reorganize the unit before considering an attack against the Mount Kozna summit position. The second company furnished the security details for our rest area and a reconnaissance detachment from the 6th company with a telephone detail reconnoitered the avenues of approach into the Mount Kozna position. From headquarters Knoll, we saw Tirgul Okna lying eastward, sorry, northeastward of us in the valley. The distance as the crow flies was not more than three miles and we could see that heavy rail movements were in process at the Tirgul Okna Railroad Station. Towards 1300 hours, or 1 p.m., the staff of the Sprosser Group arrived together with the group reserves in brackets 2nd and 3rd Company, sorry, 2nd and 3rd Battalions of the 18th Reserve Infantry Regiment, just west of the headquarters knoll. Major Sprosser had followed the attack of the Rommel detachment from his company post in the Oak Woods, and thought that we had taken Mount Kozna in one rush. At that time, nothing was known of the activities of Gosler's detachment. 
I announced my intention of continuing the attack on the summit position in an hour's time and asked for fire support from Headquarters Knoll by the machine guns of one of the two Bavarian battalions. My intention was to repeat the successful maneuver of that morning, and Major Sprosser gave his consent. At the agreed-upon time, units of the 2nd Battalion of the 18th Bavarian Reserve Infantry Regiment opened fire on the hostile positions. At the same time, I climbed down into the ravine to the east and a hundred yards north of Headquarters Knoll with the 6th, 3rd, 2nd, and 5th Companies the 3rd Machine Gun Company, and the 1st Machine Gun Company of the 11th Reserve Infantry Regiment. We followed the reconnaissance detachment's wire through thick underbrush and down an extraordinarily steep slope. Soon, we were going up the opposite side and had caught up with the reconnaissance units from the 6th Company. The hot noonday sun made the climb most strenuous, and it required several hours to reach the top with my exhausted men. With security precautions similar to those of the forenoon, we felt our way nearer and nearer to the enemy, and climbed up through light, br br light brush and small rills. The garrison of the summit, meanwhile, was engaged in a lively firefight with the 2nd Battalion of the 18th on Headquarters Knoll, and the fire from both sides whistled by high over our heads. We could clearly see a Romanian outpost some 200 yards from the Bavarians on Headquarters Knoll and directly across from them. Finally, we reached a small hollow some 80 yards from the summit. The Bavarians had ceased firing on the hostile position sectors above in order not to endanger us, and the enemy's fire likewise had ceased. I prepared my detachment for the assault with extreme care with two rifle platoons and six heavy machine guns in the front line, and two companies echeloned behind each flank. The attack preparations were identical with those of the morning. Creeping up, steady fire from the heavy machine guns, hand grenades on the right and left for diversion. And then, at long last, the final assault. Preparations were still incomplete when we plainly heard carbine fire in a southwest direction. Those sounds came from Gosler's detachment, so I immediately gave the signal to commence the attack. After a short but continuous burst of fire, the mountain troops smashed through the summit position and, in, within a few minutes, swept the western slope of Mount Kozna clear of the enemy. The enemy was so surprised that he failed to offer serious resistance in any portion of the position, and the summit was ours at slight cost in casualties. We had several dozen prisoners and a few machine guns as our bag of trophies. But the major portion of the garrison of the position escaped and fled precipitously down the eastern slopes of Mount Kozna. As we started in pursuit, very strong Romanian machine gun fire struck us on the bare eastern slopes. This came from positions lying six to seven hundred yards east of Mount Kozna's summit on a ridge running through Hill 692 from north to south. These positions were particularly well developed and protected by wide obstacles. Strong artillery and machine gun support were required before we could think of crossing the ridge and going down the eastern slope by daylight. We had to be satisfied with possession of the peak from which we could see far out into the Romanian countryside. We soon had contact with the first company, in brackets, Gosler's detachment, which was climbing up the steep ridge from the south towards Mount Kozna's summit, in brackets, Hill 788. The, Romania, the Rommel detachment dug in with the first company, in brackets, to which I attached myself, on the steep slope south of the ridge road. The fifth and sixth companies were on the peak and north of the ridge road, descending to the northwest. I split the machine gun company of the 11th Reserve Infantry Regiment among the three companies in the front line and kept the second company at my disposal behind the center. The 3rd Company and the 3rd Machine Gun Company were behind the left flank. After about an hour from the cap sorry, about an hour after the capture of Mount Kozna, Major Sprosser came up with both Bavarian battalions. 
Concerning Gosler's detachment, we learned that after capturing the Romanian positions near Hill 647, it came upon very strong enemy forces which, supported by numerous hostile batteries, soon attacked in dense masses from the east. Gosler's detachment had to be withdrawn because of heavy losses and was halted on the eastern slope of the rocky ravine leading to Mount Kozna's summit from the south. On the left, towards the Slanic Valley, our neighbor, the Hungarian 70th Honfed Division, was, several, was still several miles away and out of contact with us. During the evening hours, we watched the artillery duel north of the Slanic Valley from our summit and observed the attack movements of Romanian infantry in the region of Hill 772. I made arrangements for the night. Among other things, scouts were to be established Scouts were to establish contact with Gosler's detachment. The various companies were instructed regarding their responsibilities. I was so exhausted that I was unable to prepare my combat report for the Sprosser group. Though my new adjutant, pardon me, through my new adjutant, Lieutenant Schuster, I made a verbal report regarding the course of the day's fighting. In spite of fatigue, I found little rest that night. An hour before midnight, numerous hand grenades burst in the position of the 6th Company. Shouting, rifle, and machine gun fire resounded. Without waiting for a report, I promptly counterattacked with the 3rd Company in the direction of the threatened place, but when we arrived, the 6th Company was already master of the situation. What had happened? Romanian assault squads had surprised the Company, but were repulsed by the watchful soldiers. But during the attack, some machine gunners of the machine gun company of the 11th Reserve Infantry Regiment were taken prisoner. Observations. The plan of attack for August 11th was developed as a result of personal reconnaissance during the early morning hours. The normal attack astride the Ridge Road, supported by heavy machine guns and artillery, was rejected because of the open terrain. It would have been seen early by the enemy and would probably have been repulsed with heavy losses. The Romanians had learned something from the battles of the preceding days and had set up combat outposts in order to secure the main position. This was detected in plenty of time by sharp observation of the battlefield during the approach march. Only with a unit accustomed to the strictest combat discipline could I dare to feel my way through the hostile combat outposts by day. The time and space calculations of this type of flanking march are most difficult in the mountains. Here, the unexpected appearance of the enemy was in addition to the terrain difficulties. Cooperation with the artillery groups did not materialize during this attack, because the telephone connections broke down at the decisive moment. The artillery here would have been able to give good support to the difficult attack by the Rommel detachment. The very difficult situation after the successful breakthrough was handled by means of the reserve company. The thrust in flank and rear of the superior enemy rapidly turned the tide in our favor. In this connection, the attack schedule, quote-unquote, given to Jung's detachment ahead of time proved to be extremely valuable, for even Jung was no longer in contact with us. The fleeing Romanians were not only shot at, but units of the Rommel detachment were immediately dispatched in close pursuit, which was soon halted by hostile forces in commanding positions. While the exhausted assault troops rested, a scout squad reconnoitered the avenues of approach into the summit positions on Mount Kozna. Again, the telephone line proved most useful. The breakthrough into the hostile position at noon, as well as the breakthrough into the summit position in the evening, took place without artillery or heavy machine gun support from rearward positions. Only the machine guns located in the front line of the assault troops covered the breach with their fire. Again, the fire of the hostile garrisons of the positions were diverted to hand grenade squads. The losses in the breakthrough itself were extremely light. The garrisons of rearward Romanian positions received the retreating troops both upon the breakthrough at noon and upon the capture of the Mount Kozna summit and halted our pursuit. 
Combat on August 12, 1917. The full moon rose shortly after midnight, and the scout squads sent out to Gosler's detachment reported that this unit was located with its left flank about half a mile southeast of Mount Kozna's summit. It had sustained heavy losses and urgently requested support, for the enemy was 600 yards away and occupied very strong positions. At 0100 hours, I went on reconnaissance with some of my officers in order to examine the terrain in front of the right half of our position. I wanted to close the gap between Gosler's detachment and my right flank with a company before daybreak. And I also wanted to move my own position forward to within attack distance of the hostile positions east of Mount Kozna. But Major Sprosser did not agree to that. He instead ordered the two Bavarian divisions, pardon me, the two Bavarian battalions to break through the hostile positions northeast of Mount Kozna at dawn, while units of the Mountain Battalion under my command followed the Bavarians in second line prepared to exploit a successful breakthrough as far as Nicoresti. <clears throat> Even before daylight, we began to receive heavy artillery fire from a northwesterly direction, that is, from the left rear of our position. It came from the heights on the far side of the Slanic Valley. Their fragmentation effect was slight, but the shells nonetheless dug craters 20 to 26 feet in diameter and nearly 10 feet deep in the soft, loamy soil. Lumps of earth fell in an area a hundred yards in diameter. Sleeping was out of the question under the circumstances, and we had to move whenever the hits came too close. The fire increased and other batteries to the east Sorry, the fire increased and other batteries to the east and north selected Mount Kozna as their target, with the result that things around the summit became most uncomfortable. Shortly before daybreak, two Hungarian Honved battalions, which had been attached to Major Sprosser, arrived on the summit. One of them deployed on arrival, passed through my detachment, and without orders proceeded to attack the Romanian positions east of us. It suffered heavy losses and increased the hostile artillery fire. I was much relieved when I led my detachment, consisting of the 5th, 3rd, and 2nd Companies, the 3rd Machine Gun Company, a Honved Rifle Company, and a Honved Machine Gun Company, out of the endangered areas. The two Bavarian battalions had started out ahead of us in order to execute their mission of breaking through the Romanian position northeast of Mount Kozna by daybreak. A successful breakthrough would open the road to the plains and hasten the collapse of the Romanian mountain front south and north of the Ajtaz Valley. We crossed the western slope of Mount Kozna in a long column about 600 yards below the summit, and we were often engaged by Romanian shells of varied calibers, which struck all about us in a most unpredictable fashion. Marching in the cool of the morning made us feel very cheerful indeed. After a half hour's march through light undergrowth on a steep slope, we reached the ridge descending from the summit of Mount Kozna north towards elevation 491. Tall fir trees covered the steep slopes northeast, sorry, the steep northeastern slope, and below on the left were small sections of a continuous fir forest. Through the fir trees, we got a bird's eye view of the Romanian positions northeast of Mount Kozna which the two Bavarian battalions had to penetrate. They consisted of carefully developed trenches with continuous broad obstacles out in front. Numerous communication trenches led over the bare ridge to the wooded zone on the eastern slope. Between us and the hostile position was a draw which widened towards the northeast and whose slopes were covered with brushwood. As yet, the hostile positions had not been taken. Twelve to sixteen hundred yards north of us, we saw units of the Bavarian battalions in the broad draw just in front of the Romanian positions, engaged in a hard struggle with the position's garrisons. We passed a group of wounded from the 18th Reserve Infantry Regiment and heard that all was not well up forward. Their leading battalion came upon a hostile position suddenly and offered heavy losses, about 300 wounded in all, from small arms fire, with the net result that the breakthrough into the hostile position 
failed utterly. On the strength of this report, I ordered the detachment to fall out and rest. At the same time, I telephoned Major Sprosser, for wires had been laid along our side our advance, to inform him of the existing situation north of Mount Kozna. I ventured the opinion that since the Bavarian attack had miscarried, the only chance of taking the well-constructed position northeast of Mount Kozna was with very strong artillery support. This was promised for the forenoon. Since there were no artillery observers forward, I offered to direct the fire from my present position, which was an admirable observation post. We examined the possibility of getting down into the hollow without being observed, but could find no concealed avenue of approach, for the trees were too widely spaced. I adjusted my first artillery fire at 11.30 hours, and at that time my detachment began its descent in column of files with 20 pace intervals between men. My intention was to deliver a short but heavy artillery concentration and then smash into the position 500 yards northeast of Mount Kozna summit. Fire adjustment proved to be a slow process, however, but I finally got the center of impact of an Australian, uh, pardon me, of an Austrian howitzer battery onto the Romanian positions, only to hear that all the artillery had been ordered to cease fire for the remainder of the day because of, because of changes in position and ammunition shortages. Meanwhile, the Rommel detachment reached the southeast part of the hollow despite lively Romanian artillery fire for the enemy did not fail to observe the descent of 700 men. We found ourselves among clumps of bushes some 300 yards from the enemy obstacles and out of his line of sight. One man was wounded slightly during the ascent. I went down to the detachment and found that telephone wire had been laid. The situation did not seem too promising, and attacking an alerted enemy without adequate artillery support was out of the question for the wired-in positions were much too strong. A daylight withdrawal over the steep northeastern slope of Mount Kozna was equally unattractive in view of the excellent enemy observation and his ability to punish us severely with artillery and machine gun fire. The men could run down the slope, true, but would move very slowly uphill and would offer excellent targets for the Romanian artillery and machine guns situated above them. Heavy losses were unavoidable should the enemy decide to plaster the depression with artillery and mortar fire. In spite of the unfavorable situation, I decided to attack the Romanian positions without artillery support. I knew my men could do it, and it was better to be a hammer than an anvil. Skilled scout squads reconnoitered the hostile positions, pardon me, the hostile obstructions and the positions behind them in order to run in under the expected hostile artillery fire. I moved the detachment up through the bushes to within 200 yards of the enemy position and made my preparations for the attack in the small draws in that area. The machine gun companies located some positions up on the slope to the right, from which they could deliver supporting fires. The result of reconnaissance were not unforgivable, sorry, the results of reconnaissance were not unfavorable, and the enemy gave no signs of having noticed our offensive intentions. I was just about to order the two machine gun companies to move into their reconnoitered positions when the following order came over the telephone from Major Sprosser. Quote, the Russians have broken through in the Slanic Valley to the north and are now apparently about to come up on our rear. The Rommel detachment and the two Bavarian battalions to withdraw immediately to the ridge half a mile west of Mount Kozna. End quote. The group staff was heading there, and I was ordered to transmit this order to the 1st and 3rd battalions of the 18th Bavarian Reserve Infantry Regiment and to cover their retreat. It was obvious that the greatest difficulties would result from daylight withdrawal from the hollow in full view of the hostile force. The moment the enemy observed our retirement, he would hit us with machine gun and artillery fire or launch an attack. In either case, heavy casualties could not be avoided. The Russians caused me much less worry, since I hoped to reach the ridge before they did. Failing that, there would have to be a quick and fierce thrust to sweep them off the ridge. 
Under the command of Lieutenant Werner of the Württemberg Mountain Battalion, I sent out the two Hungarian Honved companies to climb the northeast slope of Mount Kozna, now lying in shadow, with the summit of, as their objective. With the other four companies, I myself sought the best way out through the underbrush, first in the direction of Hill 491 and later towards Headquarters Knoll. Shortly before we reached Hill 491, a few men were slightly wounded by Romanian machine gun fire. Once in the vicinity of Hill 491, I sent the third company to occupy the lower part of the ridge, in brackets 788-491, so I guess ridge 788 of Hill 491, with the task of making contact with the two Bavarian battalions. I had sent an officer to inform the battalions of the order received from Group Sprosser. Unfortunately, the telephone connection um, had been interrupted. Quite by chance, however, I did overhear a telephone conversation regarding Hill 491, which indicated that Group Headquarters, from the latest reports, was now more optimistic about the situation than it had been half an hour before. Therefore, thereupon, I moved the second company by the shortest route to the ridge leading northward from Headquarters Knoll. The company was to organize the ridge 600 yards north of Headquarters Knoll and was to provide security and reconnoiter in the direction of the Slanic Valley. I ordered all units, except the third company, to march to Headquarters Knoll while I stayed with the third company. In the course of the next hour, both Bavarian battalions succeeded in disengaging themselves from the enemy. As soon as I saw they were being successful, I took the third company and started for Mount Kozna. The first and sixth companies were still on the Kozna summit, which the increased bombardment had turned into a field pockmarked with all sized craters. I left the third company on the summit as a reinforcement to the garrison, reported to headquarters Knoll, and asked permission to go to the hospital, for I was completely exhausted and did not feel able to continue in command. The bandages on my left arm had not been changed since that morning and so I gave up command of my companies and went to get some rest near headquarters. It was pitch dark, sorry, it was a pitch dark, warm summer's night. On the Defense, August 13th through 18th of 1917. Shortly before midnight, Major Sprosser summoned me to headquarters where I found a large number of officers. Major Sprosser told me that the situation was most unfavorable. Reports from isolated units of the Hungarian 70th Honved Division, in brackets 3rd Troop Imperial and Royal Uhlans, 1st Troop Imperial and Royal Dragoons and 1st Honved Company, informed us that during the afternoon, strong Russian and Romanian forces had broken through the division in and to the north of the Slanic Valley and were preparing to move south against the Mount Kozna Unguera Ridge. We had to reckon with the assumption that, under certain conditions, the Sprosser group would be cut off, for we had no troops to our rear short of the Unguera. I was asked to express my views on the matter. My opinion was that a night attack against the Mount Kozna Unguera line was most unlikely, and that the earliest attack would come at dawn, which was only four hours away. With the group's five battalions, I considered it possible to hold the Mount Kozna Inguera line against all comers, for the retention of this position was vital to the general situation on the ground. Under no circumstances would I surrender supinely the territory taken with so much resourcefulness, skill, and blood, simply because of alarming enemy reports, sorry, alarming reports of enemy activity. I proposed the following regrouping be effected without delay. Quote, the mountain battalion assumes the defense of Mount Kozna, headquarters Knoll, and the ridge as far as Hill 674. The other battalions of the group seize and hold the ridge between 674 and Unguera. All units push through reconnaissance and security elements towards the Slanic Valley. End quote. For the deployment of the Mountain Battalion, I proposed, quote, Combat outposts, 
A rifle platoon reinforced by machine guns occupy the southern portion of Mount Kozna. The crater field on the summit is not occupied. Reconnaissance to the southeast and east. A platoon and a heavy machine gun platoon occupy the headquarters knoll and prevent the enemy from occupying Mount Kozna summit. A rifle company occupies each of the two ridges descending to the north between Mount Kozna and Elevation 674. Reconnaissance and security to the north, all remaining companies are assembled just southwest of Headquarters Knoll and held at the commander's disposal. End quote. Major Sprosser accepted my recommendations and urged me earnestly, since I took the terrain by attack, to defend the Wertenberg Mountain Battalion sector. The seriousness of the situation, concern for my fellow mountain soldiers, and last but not least, the stimulation of the difficult task ahead, led me to shoulder this new burden, in spite of my injuries. Oral group soldiers initiated the regrouping within, sorry, oral group orders initiated the regrouping, which was executed without further delay. I had the following for the defense of Mount Kozna sector. 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 5th, and 6th rifle companies, and the 3rd machine gun company of the Wartenberg Mountain Battalion, and the 3rd company of the 11th Infantry Reserve Regiment with 6 heavy machine guns. The group staff now retired to the Oak Woods by the Ridge Road Bend, a mile northeast of Unguera. With my company commanders, I discussed in detail both the situation in general and the tasks of the Wertenberg Mountain Battalion in particular. I then issued the following orders in rapid succession. Quote, the third company moves immediately from Mount Kozna to Headquarters Knoll and sends a platoon without packs, but reinforced by six light machine guns of the 3rd Company of the 11th Infantry Reserve Regiment to, lead, to relieve the 1st Company on Mount Kozna. This platoon, in brackets reinforced, occupies the wooded southern ridge and reconnoiters towards the hostile position east of Mount Kozna. In case of attack, the platoon holds its position as long as possible and retires on headquarters knoll only if threatened by encirclement. I shall give oral instructions to the platoon commander at a later time." End quote. And then the next quote here. Another platoon of the 3rd Company, as well as Albrecht's heavy machine gun platoon, dig in on the headquarters knoll so as to cover the crater field of Mount Kozna and the western slope with fire. They will prevent the enemy from crossing the bare part of Mount Kozna and threatening the combat outposts on the left flank by day. End quote for that section of the order. Next, the second company occupies the small knoll 700 yards north of the headquarters knoll, in brackets later called the Russian knoll, in, in bracket, reconnoiters towards the Slanic Valley, maintains night contact with the combat outpost on Mount Kozna by scout squads. The company will build large campfires on Mount Kozna's northwest slope in order to receive pardon me, in order to deceive the enemy and divert his artillery fire. These fires will be kept going all night. So that's the end of that particular order. Next, the fifth company, reinforced by a heavy machine gun platoon, occupies the knoll half a mile northeast of Hill 674 and prepares for all-around defense. It will reconnoiter towards the Slanic Valley and maintain contact with the second company and the neighboring troops in the region of Hill 674 and Picol Rue. To deceive the enemy and divert his artillery fire, the company builds large fires in the hollow half a mile northwest of the headquarters knoll and keeps them burning all night. And that order. Next, a platoon of the 3rd Company Aldinger's Machine Gun Platoon, 1st and 6th Companies of the Wertenberg Mountain Battalion, and the 3rd Company of the 11th Infantry Reserve Regiment go into reserve areas behind Headquarters Knoll and the descending slope a quarter of a mile to the southwest. Security and reconnaissance in the direction of Grajesti. More detailed orders will be issued at a later time. In brackets, sketch 31. <clears throat> Continuing here, though, first. Detachment command post 60 yards west of headquarters knoll. Communication platoons lay wire connected to the combat outposts and to the 2nd and 5th companies. 
that ends the orders section. We have here now sketch 31. Positions at Mount Kozna, August 13th, 1917, viewed from the west, and therefore we are facing east. North is to our left, south to our right, and again, east is before us, and we are from the south. Sorry, and we are from the west. At position A, we have enemy, sorry, we have combat outposts belonging to the Germans and Austrian troops. At position B, we have enemy positions. So here on the, I do believe, easternmost, southeasternmost side of the map, we have, it says PH 3rd Company, I do believe. And that is marked as A for the combat outposts. And we have a platoon of the 3rd Company is sort of, again, on the eastern side of the map, slightly down from the peak of the mountain there, which I do believe would be Mount Kozna, although it is not presently marked as such. And they're kind of along the top of the ridge line, it looks to be. And you've got a platoon of the 3rd Company that is... Oh, I see now. So there's platoons from the 3rd Company at the combat outposts and along the ridge line, as well as we have... It looks like the 5th Company is at the base of the ridge, and the 2nd Company is proceeding down the ridge towards the enemy positions in order to engage them in the trees. Uh, we have here other German groups at the peak of the ridge line, um, 318 Reserve Regiment, 311 Reserve, 6111, and 3-3. And there are three or four different heavy machine guns on the map here. I do believe it's four in total. One is with the 5th Company, and two of them are on the trail down the ridge on the eastern side, while one is at the peak of the ridge, and one is on the, I want to say, western side of the ridge. There's a trail that leads further along the ridge line, I would assume. In any case... Continuing now with the text. While the leaders repeated their orders, much activity began. Sorry. While the leaders repeated their orders, much activity began. The Bavarians and Honveds moved back following by the company. Sorry. The Bavarians and the Honveds moved back, followed by the companies of the Wartenberg Mountain Battalion. Sleeping was out of the question, for individual orders had to be issued on the spot in order to meet particular situations. It took three hours to get the companies into their new positions. The campfires on Mount Kozna and in the hollow northwest of Headquarters Knoll were burning, and contact with the various units had been established. The reserve units rested while those in position dug themselves in. The reconnaissance detachments made no alarming reports. My staff consisted of Lieutenant Schuster as adjutant and Lieutenant Werner as administrative officer. Towards 0500 hours, some artillery observers, including the Hungarian First Lieutenant Zeidler, arrived, and I went with them to the combat outpost on Mount Kozna. We reached Algaur's position, pardon me, Algaur's platoon, in brackets third company, just as the sun was rising above the horizon. In accordance with orders, Algaur had located his platoon on the sharp ridge leading south from Mount Kozna summit. The position was so organized as to have its flank on the edge of the thick forest some 200 yards south of the summit. The Romanian positions were visible through the haze and were on a bare ridge some 350 feet wide and about a half mile away. We saw the sun's rays reflected from the helmets of the large garrison, but there was no firing and our men, sorry, there was no firing and our men, who had had no rest, were asleep in their freshly dug foxholes, leaving only the sentries to keep sharp watch in the enemy's direction. The slope in front of the platoon position fell sharply to the east and was covered with short shrubbery. The ridge itself, as well as its western slope, was covered with large trees and had little or no protective undergrowth. While discussing emergency barrages and harassing fire with the artillery observers, the various sentries reported, quote, The Romanians are leaving their positions in a skirmish line and are advancing towards Mount Kozna, end quote. 
Shortly thereafter, violent Romanian machine gun fire was directed at the Mount Cosna ridgeline, and heavy artillery began to fire on headquarters knoll. I got through to our artillery and requested harassing fire on the Romanian positions east of Mount Cosna, from which increasing numbers of troops were coming. In the meantime, this report arrived, quote, strong enemy has been located just in front of the line of combat outposts and is climbing the ridge from the right. The bursting of numerous hand grenades, lively carbine and machine gun fire confirmed this report. Retribution was being exacted for inadequate security measures on the steep eastern slope. By telephone, I ordered the reserve platoon of the 3rd Company and Aldinger's machine gun platoon forward at the double to reinforce the combat outposts. This order was followed by a request to the group for emergency barrages. I made a tour of the front lines and found that the Romanians had secured a foothold on the ridge and were delivering flanking fire on our combat outposts. All frontal attacks had been beaten off, and our artillery was smashing up the many Romanian reinforcements on the bare slope. On the left, the heavy machine gun and rifle fire from headquarters Knoll prevented the Romanians from crossing either summit or the northwestern slope of Mount Cosna. This fire also protected our combat outposts on the left flank. In brackets again, we have here sketch 32, which does not appear to be shown in order here is as part of this actual PDF file, digital copy of the book, but doubtless I'll be able to splice in some footage that is appropriate when the time comes for this recording. Continuing here nonetheless, I ordered Technical Sergeant Al Gower to hold the position at all costs until the arrival of reinforcements, and I ran back to speed the reinforcements on their way. Heavy shell were still hitting headquarters knoll, where I met the two platoons preparing to get underway, and we hurried forward at the double. The noise of battle had increased considerably, and we hoped that Al Gower was holding on. Oddly enough here it says 178. No explanation as to that. It could be an indication of page number from an earlier version of the text. According to the PDF sort of information piece on this digital edition, we're on page 123. However, this 178 would appear to be a page number that was not edited out properly when they converted this from a digital file to a digital file from the original version. So I don't know why it's there, some form of typo. Nonetheless, continuing on. In the saddle between Headquarters Knoll and Mount Cosna, we encountered several light machine gun crews of the 3rd Company 11th Infantry Reserve Regiment who were part of Al Gower's platoon. Apparently, it had become too hot for them up front, and I treated them with scant consideration and took them along with me. A hundred yards east of the saddle, we saw Al Gower's entire platoon coming towards us. Al Gower reported that large Romanian bodies had pushed up the slope, and that these and the strong fire from below on the right had compelled him to give up the position. I was in no frame of mind to surrender Mount Cosna at so cheap a price, and organized my forces for a counter-thrust. Lieutenant Aldinger took two heavy machine guns and went into a position in the woods on the right and kept the ridge hitherto occupied by Al Gower's platoon under steady fire. <coughs> Simultaneously, we climbed the ridge and passed through dense bushes before reaching the ridge line. Having arrived there, we charged ahead and swept the surprised enemy from the ridge and drove him down to the east. We also seized the, prom the promontory down to the right. And here at last we have sketch 32, which I had been unable to look at previously. So sketch 32, the defense of Mount Cosna. August 13th, 1917. So, presuming the black uh, arrows to be enemy troops of Russian and Romanian extraction, we can therefore infer that the Austrian, German, and Prussian forces under Rommel are going to be the white arrow, I do believe. So, here we have what appears to be the trench line that they have sort of strung out in a variety of positions. They have a combat outpost that is very nearly being encircled, and that is at the peak of Mount Cosna. And 
uh, that you can see basically enemies springing forth from their trenches and making for that particular outpost and doing so quite successfully. The fifth company is stationed on what looks to be a hilltop and they've got a bunch of trees providing cover and they're fairly well dug in. And then you see the 11th and 12th companies moving to defend the third company and basically defend the main sort of trench line they've dug between Mount Kozna and the hill on which 5th Company is situated. 6th uh, Company and 1st Company, as well as the command post, are located on the southern end of the map, well, southwestern side of the map, I should say, more accurately. And they are behind a trench line and fending off a attack from the enemy. Second company is holding its own on sort of a curved line at the very far end, and it, it does appear to be the case that the enemy is amassing for some sort of a charge there, while the rest are just kind of charging in willy-nilly, sort of all over the place, not with any real form of organization. Continuing here. But the Romanians were tenacious and did not let go. We clearly heard the commands of the enemy leaders down below us on the arched slope. And soon, bitter hand grenade battles began at various places. The slope was so steep that our hand grenades did not burst among the Romanians lying in readiness 125 yards below us, but actually instead fell even farther before detonating. To reach him with a carbine meant exposure of head and shoulders, a procedure most disadvantageous at our short ranges. Losses began to increase, and Dr. Lenz had much more work to do in the front line. The mountain troopers fought with exemplary bravery. Many wounded returned to the firing line after having their wounds bandaged. All Romanian footholds on the ridge were immediately wiped out by counterattacks mounted by the nearest group of mountain soldiers at hand. The hard battle, replete with casualties, lasted for several hours, and the, and the munitions and hand grenades gradually became scarce, while hostile artillery fire against the headquarters knoll only increased in vigor. Telephone connection between Headquarters Knoll and the Combat Outpost position was shot away. If I wanted to hold on to my Combat Outpost positions, then the time had come to reinforce them with additional forces, ammunition, and hand grenades. In order to expedite matters, in brackets, telephone communications was lacking, I put Lieutenant Sch Sch Stelrecht the third company commander in command and ordered him to hold at all costs while I hurried back to headquarters Knoll, where I found the following situation. The platoon of the third company and Albrecht's heavy machine gun platoon had used up nearly all of their ammunition against the enemy, who was threatening the left flank of the command outpost from the crater field on Mount Kozna. My reserve companies, in brackets, 1st and 6th companies of the Wertenberg Mountain Battalion, as well as the 3rd Company, 11th Infantry Reserve Regiment, had occupied the southern slope of Headquarters Knoll on their own initiative because strong enemy forces were reported ascending towards Headquarters Knoll through the ravines from Grozesti. Before I had units of these companies ready for use, however, we had reports that strong Romanian forces were advancing both from the south and from the north against the saddle between Headquarters Knoll and Mount Kozna, and that the combat outposts had abandoned Mount Kozna and were retiring on Headquarters Knoll. Within the next few minutes, in brackets, I still had no men at my disposal. The noise of battle approached dangerously near to Headquarters Knoll, and the riflemen of the 3rd Company were retiring on the knoll, hard-pressed by a superior and aggressive enemy. They brought their dead and wounded, including Lieutenant Hummel, back with them, for they had no intention of allowing anyone, living or dead, to fall into enemy hands. Hand grenades and machine gun ammunition had given out. Carbine ammunition had become short, and they were very threatened with encirclement from either flank. The lack of ammunition and hand grenades made it most difficult to stop the attack of the Romanian masses against Headquarters Knoll. The heavy machine guns and machine gunners had to defend their positions with pistols and hand grenades. 
and the few runners of my staff were used at a threatening sorry were used at threatened places violent fighting raged along the entire front at that moment i discovered large numbers of romanians in the wooded part of the depression 700 yards northwest of headquarters knoll i informed the second and fifth companies by telephone regarding the new danger which threatened their flanks and rear in all parts of the sector, violent fighting was going on, with, and a withdrawal was out of the question. What would happen on headquarters knoll when the ammunition was completely expended? With the dominant position in enemy hands, the entire battalion would be in a most precipitous predicament, and our entire defense could collapse. We could not allow that to happen. Telephone connection with the group still existed, and I described our current state of crisis and urgently requested immediate reinforcements, including small arms and ammunition resupply. I stressed the fact that time was not to be wasted. The worries of the next half hour were indescribable. But at our 11th hour, the 11th and 12th companies, 18th Bavarian Infantry Reserve Regiment, and a heavy machine gun platoon came to our assistance. The 12th company, with the heavy machine gun platoon, went into position on headquarters knoll, and I kept the 11th company in reserve on the slope 300 yards west of headquarters knoll, where I also located the detachment command post. From there, I had an excellent view of the whole battleground. I used the reserve company to resupply the forward positions with ammunition and hand grenades. All troops not actually firing at the enemy plied their spades with great vigor. The machine gun fire from dominating positions on Mount Kozna was most annoying to those on headquarters Knoll and the Ridge. I withdrew Aldinger's heavy machine gun platoon from the front line and put it in a defense zone in the neighborhood of the detachment command post. Furthermore, I established ammunition supply units and put my supply system in order. <clears throat> the battle for the headquarters knoll and Russian knoll continued for hours without pause. The enemy repeatedly hurled new forces against our thin lines, and Romanian artillery concentrations on the slope just west of headquarters knoll prevented contact with the front line and tore up our telephone connections. But the Bavarians and the Wertenbergers up front held their positions, and our own artillery did a good job during the course of the day in giving us emergency barrages at all threatened points. Its shells thinned the ranks of the Romanians, who were lying in defense masses, pardon me, who were lying in dense masses on their lines of departure. To counter the strong enemy force now milling around in the depression a half mile northwest of headquarters Knoll, I arranged for the cooperation of several batteries to prepare saturation barrages, hold them at the ready, and fire them on signal, which could be done within a matter of minutes. In spite of the excellent artillery cooperation, I still lacked observers up forward, and was also in need of wire communication with the artillery command posts. By noon, there were mountains of dead and wounded Romanians in front of headquarters Knoll, but the 12th Company of the 18th Infantry had also suffered heavily and had to be reinforced with elements of the 11th Company. Later still, more elements of the 11th Company had to be used to fill the gaps in the 2nd Mountain Company. The defense arrangements on headquarters and Russian knolls included light frontline garrisons with strong counterattack groups assembled under cover in the vicinity of the more threatened portion of the position. With the mission of immediately ejecting the enemy from any point where he managed to effect a breakthrough. This type of defense lent itself to our particular terrain. In the afternoon, the 10th Company of the 18th Infantry arrived as additional support, and I ordered it to dig a communication trench from Headquarters Knoll to the Detachment Command post. The Romanians switched their main attack against Russian Knoll. Their Hugel's platoon had organized itself for all-around defense in some old Romanian positions, and was hit hard from the north and east by an enemy who outnumbered him ten to one. The enemy tried repeatedly to regain positions whose installation had cost him weeks of work. 
Aldinger's heavy machine gun platoon at the detachment command post spoiled all enemy attacks from the west against Hugel's platoon, and the second company gallantly held its ground. The battalion, the, sorry, the battle raged in undiminished fury and almost without interruption into the late afternoon. For the third time, I ordered ammunition and hand grenades replenished in the front line. Through the smoke clouds of our heavy shells, in brackets, calibers up to 305 millimeter were used in the defensive fire, we saw more and more fresh Romanian troops descending the slopes of Mount Kozna in our direction. When the second company reported that it had melted away to such an extent that it was obliged to retire from Russian Knoll, I sent the remaining elements of the 11th Company, 18th Infantry, to its support. At the same time, I ordered two heavy machine gun platoons to prepare for destruction fire on Russian Knoll. When these preparations were completed, I ordered the second company to vacate Russian Knoll rapidly. As expected, the hostile forces stormed up on the bare knoll in a dense mass. At the same moment, the destruction fire of the heavy machine gun platoons struck amongst them and mowed them down like ripe wheat before the scythe. In full flight, the survivors fled the dangerous knoll, and shortly thereafter, the reinforced second company was again in possession and was allowed a brief respite. <clears throat> Somewhat later, the Romanian forces, which ha we had observed for hours in the depression half a mile northwest of Headquarters Knoll, started moving up the slope to the south. The previously prepared artillery fire was requested and had excellent effect. It drove the enemy back into the lower woods. Thus, the rifle and machine gun fire prepared for the reception of this enemy by the 2nd, 12th, and 5th companies and the three heavy machine gun platoons was unnecessary. During the battle, message after message came from the front line. The adjutant and the administration officer had their hands full in executing hasty requests for protective fire, keeping up the flow of ammunition, combat supplies, and rations, as well as informing Sprosser Group as to the state of the battle. Double wire lines were laid to the more threatened points and to Major Sprosser's command post and kept in repair by the untiring communications men. A most dangerous job in view of the almost continuous machine gun and artillery fire which kept searching the area. In spite of the heaviest losses, the Romanians continued their attack into the night, but failed to gain a foot of ground. When the noise of battle died down in the night, we heard the groans and laments of the wounded all along the front. Our stretcher bearers were fired on as they attempted to help some of the unfortunate men, and had to return without accomplishing their mission. In my opinion, the enemy would repeat his attacks on August 14th with still stronger use of artillery and fresh infantry forces. Such serious losses as we suffered on August 13th could not be repeated. Therefore, I ordered the short hours of the night employed in fortifying our positions and reorganizing the defense at various places. With the company and platoon leaders, some of whom had little experience in this type of combat, I traced out the main line of resistance on the ground and prescribed the type of construction to be used in the defensive installations. During the night, fields of fire had to be cleared at various points. Furthermore, in the arrangement of the rifle and heavy machine gun nests, it must be remembered that the enemy was able to cover them from dominant positions on Mount Kozna. The 233rd Pioneer Company, which was brought up and assigned to me just before dark, was given the extensive work on Headquarters Knoll. Only just before midnight were all portions of the extended sector assigned to units which began work immediately. I was exhausted when I reached my command post, but a warm meal refreshed me. Sleep was out of the question. The wounded had to be attended to, ammunition and hand grenades had to be resupplied to the companies in the front line and the depots before daybreak. Provisions had to be brought up to the individual companies, the communications platoon had to lay a double line of, to the artillery fire direction center, and then the combat report for August 13th had to be forwarded to the Sprosser group. <coughs> busy, busy. We finally finished all this work, and at 0400 hours, I tried at long last to get some sleep. 
but it was so cold that I gave up on the idea. So I took Lieutenant Werner and inspected the night's work in the early dawn light. I had not had a chance to remove my shoes for more than five days, and, as a result, my feet were badly swollen. Also, I had no opportunity to renew the bandage on my left arm or to change the blood-stained overcoat hung around my shoulders and my likewise blood-stained trousers. I felt very debilitated, but the weight of responsibility was such that I did not consider going back to the hospital. At daybreak on August 14th, a Honved infantry company with light machine guns arrived, and I ordered it to relieve the first and third companies. I put these two companies in reserve just west of my command post. The 11th and 12th companies of the 18th Infantry Divisions, pardon me, the 18th Infantry Regiment, had taken over respectively the headquarters knoll position and the position astride the Ridge Road. I left the 10th company of the 18th Infantry in its position in the woods 300 yards west of Russian Knoll. It had pushed its security elements to the north and northwest in the direction of the Slanic Valley. We were ready and felt the battle could commence. Pardon me, could recommence. During the whole forenoon, the Russian artillery bombarded our position on headquarters knoll. The Ridge Road and Russian knoll very actively, but caused little in the way of damage. In all sectors, work was carried out busily and the, prepar and the positions were further improved so that a strong Romanian attack on the whole front at noon was easily repulsed. The second company on Russian Knoll suffered heavily from the fire of a Romanian battery, located in an open position about a mile away. Since we had not one single artillery observer in our sector, our corrections were telephoned to artillery control in the Oak Woods. All our efforts to silence this battery went for naught. The enemy strengthened his positions on the western slope of Mount Kozna, and the hostile wounded continued to groan and moan right in front of our lines. Our own losses on August 14th were slight, and on August 15th, it was such a quiet day that we faced far fewer. Still, pardon me, I'm going to reread that. Our own losses on August 14th were slight, and August 15th was also a quiet day. I took advantage of this respite to have two draftsmen reproduce and grid a sketch map of the Mount Kozna terrain, which I had drawn to the scale of 1 to 5,000, by which I can only infer they mean 1 meter, or 1 inch to 5,000 feet, or 5,000 meters? That, that would be 5 kilometers square, that can't be right. Um, 1 to 5,000 of something. I can only presume it's either one inch to 5,000 yards or one inch to 5,000 meters, which would be, yeah, one inch to five kilometers, but whatever. The group artillery commander and the artillery observers received copies. <clears throat> the artillery made sufficient copies so that distribution was made to include all batteries. A grid or sketch greatly facilitates adjustment of fire in mountainous or wooded terrain where it is often difficult to select visible aiming points or targets by map study alone. For example, I notified the artillery as such, quote, request emergency barrage in squares 65 and 66. If now the requested fire was outside of them, then it sufficed to say emergency barrage requested in squares 65 and 66 has struck in squares 74 and 75 in order to bring the fire quickly into the desired region. Combat information within one's own unit and group was considerably simplified. For example, quote, Romanian battery located in square 243A. Continuing. In the night of August 15th, the mortar company under Lieutenant Voller arrived, made a night reconnaissance, and began emplacing its mortars into position. Captain Gosler came forward to spell me, for I had not had any rest for a week. Command remained in my hands, however. In the afternoon, the 4th Company arrived as additional reinforcements, and I found my force had grown to 16 and a half companies, more strength than an entire regiment. The 11th Infantry Reserve Regiment was on our right, but our left was still up in the air. 
Brigade was trying hard to establish a continuous front, but insufficient troops were available for such a task. The defense of the steep, wooded slopes of the Slanic Valley required an enormous force. Following a period of oppressive heat, a heavy thunderstorm broke on August 16th, and the thunder echoed and re-echoed in the mountains, accompanied by pouring rain from the low-hanging clouds. The covered Romanian positions west of the command post gave shelter to the staff and the detachment reserves, but not for long, for they soon filled and had to be vacated. With lightning flashing all around, we lay in the open, sopping wet, when a sudden hail of artillery of all calibers drowned out the noise of thunder. Violent rifle and machine gun fire began up front, accompanied by hand grenade bursts. No doubt about it. The Romanians hoped to surprise us in the storm. I began to wonder if the front still held or had already been overrun. The rain beat into our faces so sharply that visibility was cut down to a few yards. Should I wait for reports? No. Now was the time for action. Headquarters Knoll was the focal point, and within a few minutes I reached a point just to the west of the Knoll. With me was the 6th Company, bayonets fixed and ready to counterattack. Our emergency barrage plowed up the region in which the Romanian masses were attacking. A combat telephone line connected us with my staff and thus with all points in the sector. The Romanian attack collapsed everywhere and night put an end to the confusion of battle in the streaming rain. Only after suffering heavy losses in dead and wounded did the enemy retire from the area in front of our positions. Upon return to my command post at the conclusion of fighting, I found the place on which we had pitched our tents plowed up by heavy shells. Under these conditions, I moved the command post 300 yards to the right. We dried our wet clothing on our bodies by the heat of a fire tended by Romanian prisoners of war. We were in fine spirits. Hmm. Observations the task of the Wertenberg Mountain Battalion on August 13th to defend parts of Mount Kozna and the high ground immediately to the west was exceptionally difficult. With no contact on either flank, the battalion had to prepare for strong hostile attacks not only on the front, but also on both flanks. Then, too, the very irregular, thickly wooded terrain on both sides of the Bear Ridge favored hostile approach to within attacking distance. Furthermore, the Romanian artillery was in a position in a semicircle around the Württemberg Mountain Battalion. Under these circumstances, a defense in great depth and a retention of strong reserves was desirable. Active combat reconnaissance towards the south, east, and north was necessary, even before daybreak, in order to determine the hostile offensive intentions. Furthermore, the unsurveyable terrain out in front of our positions had to be kept under constant and sharp observation. Where that was not done, as at the combat outposts, unwelcome surprises were experienced. The fighting at the combat outposts was very difficult. To be sure, they had a field of fire from the sharp ridge of Mount Kozna far into the open hostile territory but the arched, steep, and densely covered slope in the immediate foreground could not be covered with fire. Their security measures were utterly inadequate. It was here that the Romanians made preparations for a daylight attack with strong force. Their attack was a complete surprise for the combat outposts. Machine gun and rifle fire from Headquarters Knoll against the bare summit and lightly wooded western slope of Mount Kozna managed to protect the left flank of the combat outposts for a considerable period of time, and it was only when ammunition gave out on Headquarters Knoll that the enemy managed to set foot on Mount Kozna. Under the quickly organized fire support of a heavy machine gun platoon, it was possible to regain the last line of the combat outposts without suffering much in the way of casualties. The fire and movement of the assault squads were in complete unison here. The fighting along the outpost line and for headquarters knoll are excellent examples of the rapidity with which ammunition becomes exhausted at the focal points of combat. In such cases, especially within the mountains, resupply must be established at the earliest possible moment. 
Besides that, a reserve of ammunition and close combat weapons must be on hand in the battalion. The battalion supply point must be constantly informed as to the amounts of ammunition on hand in the forward line and must get resupply started. Supply worked well in the course of the fighting on August 13th. Reserves were urgently needed during the heavy fighting on August 13th. Without them, the position could not have been held again and again. Losses in the principal combat zone had to be replaced by reserves. The supply of ammunition and close combat weapons was brought to the front line by the reserves. During the battle, a communication trench had to be dug by a reserve company from the battalion command post to headquarters Knoll. The focal point of the fighting, sorry, implying that headquarters Knoll was the focal point of the fighting. Allow me to reread that sentence. During the battle, a communication trench had to be dug by a reserve company from the battalion command post to headquarters Knoll, which was the focal point of the fighting. Without that trench, supply would have been brought up only with heavy losses in the face of hostile fire from the dominant Mount Kozna position. Even at the beginning of the defensive battle, the Wertenberg Mountain Battalion was deeply, uh, deeply echeloned in the main area of combat. The 5th and 2nd companies and the forces disposed on headquarters Knoll could support each other with fire. During the battle, reserves at the foci, I do believe they mean focal point, of, fight, of the fighting, in brackets, headquarters Knoll and Russian Knoll, deepened the, dense, de deepened the defense area. It would have been a mistake to put everything in the front line of nests. The losses were heaviest there after all and they would have been still greater if the garrison there had been stronger. It is easy to break a line. The cooperation with the artillery was very satisfactory on August 16th. Of course, an artillery liaison party or forward observers in the battalion sector would have accomplished still more advantageous results. The grid sketch prepared during the defense was very valuable indeed. It corresponded to the plain table or plotting board of the present day. The present day. Next here, the second storming of Mount Kozna, August 19th, 1917. After several days of heavy fighting, our neighbor on the left, in brackets 7th, 70th, Honstead Division, succeeded in advancing north of the Slanic Valley, and a continuation of the attack on a broad front on both sides of the Ajtaz and Slanic Valleys was planned for August 18th. Mount Kozna was to be attacked once more and siege, seizure of positions to the east was part of the general plan. Then the command hoped to effect the breakthrough. For the attack against the Mount Kozna Massif, we had Madlung's group, in brackets 72nd Infantry Reserve Regiment, on the right, and the Sprosser group, in brackets Württemberg Mountain Battalion and 1st Battalion 18th Infantry, on our left. On August 17th, I was ordered to complete all attack preparation for the frontline units of Sprosser's group. I was also instructed to acquaint the regimental and battalion commanders of Madlung's group on the spot with the terrain over which they were to attack. As a result, I was on my feet from dawn till dusk. It says dawn till dark, actually. Pardon me. When I returned to my command post, I learned that, following a strong artillery preparation, the Romanians had launched an attack against the Picolru from the Slanic Valley that is, from the left rear of our positions. They were opposed by elements of the 18th Bavarian Infantry Reserve Regiment, and the sounds of battle indicated that the Romanians were making considerable progress there. My flank and rear appeared threatened, and I was afraid of being cut off from the group. As a preventative measure, I hurried part of my reserves, in brackets, two rifle companies, one machine gun company, at the double to the vicinity of Hill 674 and concealed them there in clumps of bushes ready for a counterattack should they be called upon. Telephone communication was established with my command post and group headquarters reported that the Bavarians on Picolru had stopped the attackers. Consequently, my reserves were not committed. 
the attack against Mount Kozna was postponed one day. During the night of August 17th to 18th, the companies in the right-hand part of the sector were relieved and moved to the second line. On August 18th, the second company, with units of the 18th Infantry, cleared the Romanians from the ridge 600 yards north of Russian Knoll. On this rainy day, I roamed the territory around Russian Knoll with German and Austrian artillery observers and perfected plans for artillery support for the attack on August 19th against the northern part of Mount Kozna. Before daybreak on August 19th, the assault troops of Sprosser's group assembled in the draw northwest of Headquarters Knoll. A new grouping had been organized. I led the assault companies consisting of the 1st, 4th, and 5th companies, 2nd and 3rd machine gun companies, an, armed assault, pardon me, an army assault detachment, and an engineer platoon. Captain Gosler was to follow up in the second line with the 2nd and 6th companies and the 1st machine gun company. Sprosser's group also had the 1st machine, uh, pardon me, the 1st battalion, 18th infantry, at its disposal. My detachment assembled in the clumps of bushes and strips of wood just west of Russian Knoll, while the other units of Sprosser's group assembled farther to the west. The enemy had built a continuous trench system and had erected obstacles in front of it on the ridge running from Mount Kozna summit northwest in the direction of elevation 491. By sharp observation with field glasses, we could see parts of the position and the obstacles between the bushes. We have here sketch 33, the situation at Mount Kozna, August 19, 1917, viewed from the west. So, Mount Kozna is basically dead center of the map, left is north, we are on the west side, facing, so we are always facing east and Mount Kozna is due east of the position we are viewing from. We can here see Headquarters Knoll on the west side of Mount Kozna, and there appear to be a number of mortars and other emplacements aimed at the enemy positions on Mount Kozna. And we have a line in a trench marked as being Madlung, which evidently is someone on the German side. We also have the operating post of what appears to be either the enemy or some of Rommel's people, because I'm not entirely certain, as it appears to be awfully close to the enemy trench, but in any case, it says OP, so operational post, and we can see on what appears to be the east side of Mount Kozna, or northeast side at the very least, there appear to be another trench line and some enemy um, artillery positions that have been emplaced. As for Rommel's detachment, he is on the northernmost side of Mount Kozna on what is marked as Russian Knoll, which, as we know already, appears to have been the Russian position that they had set up their little base camp on that the Germans already took previously under Rommel's tutelage and instruction and oversight, I suppose, as well. In any case, from the looks of it, yeah, the enemy has like a contiguous line with no real break in it, as far as I can tell from the map, although there may be one on the north side, it, it's very difficult to tell. Suffice it to say, this is going to be a difficult, to, difficult plan as far as how to retake this thing. I mean, they took it once, and it cost them dearly, and now they have to do it all over again. All right. According to division orders, this position was to be taken after a one-hour artillery bombardment. After another hour's bombardment, the particularly strong fortified position half a mile east of Mount Kozna Summit was also to be taken. This was the position we had come up against on August 13th. I intended to break into the hostile Mount Kozna position during the artillery bombardment, advance through this position a little, and then shift our artillery fire on the second Romanian position and start attacking it as well. The summer weather on August 19th was magnificent. There was no fighting in the Mount Kozna sector during the early morning hours. The assault troops were hidden away in the bushes. Towards 0600 hours, I sent out Technical Sergeant Friedel of 5th Company with 10 men and a telephone squad, explained my plan of attack, and gave them the following mission. Quote, 
the Friedel Scout Squad, under cover of bushes and depressions, to climb from Russian Knoll through the ravine to the east, out into that hollow over there, pointing to the hollow with my finger, towards the site of the planned breakthrough, and reconnoiter, uh, yeah, reconnoiter the obstacles in front of the position. Wire cutters are to be taken along, and continuous contact, even during the approach, is to be maintained with the detachment command posts through the telephone squad. With a high-powered glass, I pointed out to Friedel the position of the intended breakthrough and the probable way in which it could be reached. <clears throat> a half hour later, I saw Friedel's scout squad climbing the western slope of Mount Kozna. In the meantime, I had located Romanian sentries in trenches near the breakthrough site. The telephone connection with the Friedel scout squad was in order and I could keep him informed of all new developments in the hostile position above him. I could also tell him at any time how far he was from the hostile position and could guide him to the intended breakthrough site. It did not take him long to reach the hostile obstruction. When the Romanian sentries in the trench became uneasy, apparently they had seen or heard the scout squad, I withdrew it, it 200 meter, sorry, I withdrew it 200 yards from the wire entanglement and had Lieutenant Voller's mortar company open fire on the breakthrough point from positions in our rear. Shells were soon bursting around the hostile sentries and they either dove for cover or moved laterally out of the danger area. While Voller's company was using fire for effect, I ordered Friedel to cut a passage through the hostile obstacles 50 yards from our shell bursts. This job was accomplished rapidly and without disturbance. The artillery preparation was scheduled for 1100 hours, and at 0900 we started out with the detachment of the path taken by Friedel and marked by the telephone line. <clears throat> The slope from Russian Knoll down to the ravine on the east was in the sun, and the bushes gave insufficient cover, and the Romanians soon discovered the movement. In spite of increased intervals between men and a more rapid pace, Romanian machine gun fire caused a few casualties. On the other hand, Mount, Kozna arched west, Mount Kozna's arched western slope was defilated from enemy fire and was not being observed by the enemy. When I reached Friedel with the head of the column, the hostile obstacles had been cut through up to the last few wires. During the advance of the detachment, Lieutenant Voller, who remained behind in observation on Russian Knoll, had kept me constantly informed of all developments in the hostile position. From time to time, upon my request, he had a few mortar shells fired for harassing effect. I had the companies close up 50 yards away from our breakthrough point and began to examine the possibilities for launching our attack from a line nearer to our selected breakthrough site. Gosler's detachment was moving up through the draw on our right. It was 10.30 hours and the 1st Battalion, 18th Battalion, sorry, and the 1st Battalion, 18th Infantry was still climbing. My plans were to attack shortly after the artillery preparation began, and this meant that I had to speed up my attack preparations in turn. The entire second machine gun company and a platoon of the fifth company were to deceive, divert, and pin down the hostile garrison of the positions above those we were attacking. These units were to crawl into position under cover of darkness and fire only on order. Pardon me, just under cover, not cover of darkness. These units were to crawl into position under cover and fire only on order. Their left flank was just above the gap in the wire entanglement. A few seconds after their formation, after this formation opened fire, Friedel's assault squad was to attack down the path through the wire, break into the position, and block off both shoulders of the penetration. I, on, in turn, was to follow on Friedel's heels with the rest of the 5th Company, Lieutenant Loitz's heavy machine gun platoon, and the remaining units of my detachment. Following a successful penetration, I intended to take the 5th Company and drive straight ahead, paying no attention to developments on either flank, and seize the ridge lying to the northwest. 
I was to be followed by the 3rd Machine Gun Company, the 1st and 4th Companies, the Army Assault Detachment, and the Engineer Platoon. We have here sketch 34, Breakthrough on the Slopes of Mount Kozna, August 19th, 1917. So, we can see the enemy line with its machine gun emplacements, and the machine guns of the enemy appear to be situated in such a way as to be aimed away from where they are actually charging through the break, which is regrettable for the enemy, I must admit. And we have here the second machine gun fump company and its fire team, I suppose, firing three heavy machine guns at the enemy line, which is basically why that particular machine gun has been tilted in their direction, I can presume. And the 5th Company and the 3rd Machine Gun Company are proceeding through the break in the enemy line. Meanwhile, the 1st Company is in behind them, and the 2nd Machine Gun Company, which has thus far just been busily distracting the enemy, is proceeding towards the break in the enemy line, as is Gosler's detachment, which is farther up in the hills, along with 4th Company, it seems, who are both sort of more or less held in reserve, as far as the map seems to indicate. Continuing, Leutz's heavy machine gun platoon was given the job of sweeping the hostile position from the place of breakthrough to the right, in brackets uphill, and left, in brackets downhill, with heavy machine gun fire. All other units remained in reserve. The units used for deception were to follow us into the captured position as soon as possible. Captain Gosler and I agreed that his forces would follow behind me. Elements of the 1st Battalion, 18th Company, had the job of rolling up the enemy flanks on Mount Kozna from our breakthrough point in the direction of Elevation 491. The remainder of the battalion remained in group reserve. Our artillery began to plaster the Mount Kozna positions before we had completed our attack preparations and before the other detachments had occupied their positions from which they were to exploit our breakthrough. The 210mm and 305mm shells threw earthen geysers into the air, and earthen bushes splattered down all about us and the enemy. The mountain soldiers' hearts rejoiced as this powerful aid, sorry, the 210mm and 305mm shells threw earthen geysers into the air, and earthen bushes splattered down. The mountain soldiers' hearts rejoiced at this powerful aid by the sister arm, by which they mean sister arm of the military forces. As prearranged, the breakthrough place itself, Square 14, was free of our artillery fire. Here our mortars did excellent preparatory work, and five minutes after the start of the artillery fire, I gave my detachments the signal to attack. The fire unit up above blazed away followed a few seconds later by Friedel's assault squad running through the entanglement path and into the hostile position. Then the forward units of my detachment began to move. The sharp crack of hand grenades in our immediate vicinity drowned out the noise of firing up and on the right. A few strides through the smoke and haze, and we were in the hostile trench. Friedel's assault squad had done a magnificent job. But unfortunately, the valiant technical sergeant had been killed in the head of his men by the pistol shot of a Romanian cavalry captain. Yet those mountain soldiers pressed the attack with increasing violence and overwhelmed the trench garrison in close combat. The captain and ten men were captured, and then the assault squad divided to the right and left to block off the shoulders. I reached the trench at the head of my detachment. Up on the right, the trench garrison was still resisting the attack supposedly coming from that direction. The configuration of the terrain and the dense undergrowth prevented these people from seeing that we had already smashed into their position. They did not see company after company moving at the double into the gap in their defensive system. Confusion reigned. Hand grenades burst all about. Machine gun and rifle fire crisscrossed the bushes and heavy shells burst in the immediate vicinity. The assault squad had cut a hole 40-odd yards wide in the enemy position and had blocked off the shoulders. 
to smash the enemy positions down slope would have been easy, but I adhered to my original plan and left this to the following units. According to the original mission, the 5th Company was already pushing through the bushes in a northeasterly direction towards the nearest ridge. Shortly thereafter, Lieutenant Loitz opened fire with his heavy machine guns from the blocking off positions on the enemy garrison up and down the slope, and I could push my way up with the 5th Company into the defense area without too much concern. The adjutant announced the success of the breakthrough to group headquarters and requested shifting the heavy caliber artillery fire to the positions east of Mount Kozna in Sprosser's group area. Further, in the defense zone, pardon me, in the defensive zone, we overran Romanian reserves and took over 100 prisoners. The rest fled. During the pursuit, a few 305mm shells hit in our immediate vicinity and blew huge craters in the loamy soil, which could easily accommodate entire companies. This artillery did us no harm, but made us hold our breath. We moved on. When we reached the ridge a quarter of a mile northeast of our line of departure, we saw our next objective lying far below us and some 700 yards away. German shells were striking in the draw ahead through which several Romanian companies were retreating in disorder. I quickly ordered a heavy machine gun platoon to open fire on the retreating enemy, and ordered the remainder of the detachment to go down into the draw and pursue the retreating enemy. By telephone, the line had been brought along during the advance, I requested strong artillery fire in squares 76, 75, 74, 73, 72, 62, 52, and 42. True to my original plan, I intended to storm the second Romanian position after a short artillery bombardment. It turned out far differently. The brief arrangement and telephone conversation required only a few minutes, and the few German shells were striking down below in the draw. The Romanians were hurrying back to their new position over a narrow path towards the bushes as the fire of several heavy machine guns was striking among them. The effect was devastating at this short range. I questioned the advisability of taking advantage of the enemy's panic and overwhelming the second position by vigorous pursuit. To be sure, we would come under our own artillery fire, but we had just escaped the bursts of our own 305mm shells without injury. Nothing worse awaited us forward. We have here sketch 35. Rommel detachment overruns enemy secondary on the northern slope of Mount Kozna. August 19th, 1917. So here we can see the assembly area on the western side. The map faces north and we're viewing from above. So the, again, the assembly area for the presumably German troops, I want to say, is on the western side. And we can see them proceeding to join up with the Madlung group. And the Madlung group is engaging the easternmost point of the first enemy trench line. The people gathered in the assembly area, presumably part of the Rommel detachment, breach that first enemy trench line and proceed out. And it looks like Madlung's group is attacking the enemy line directly in front of Mount Kozna from the western side. In any case, the Rommel detachment bypasses Mount Kozna by traveling north around it, and then they reach the second enemy trench line, they breach it, and then they break up into various groups with the 5th Company heading north to attack and encircle and then destroy the enemy forces along that section of trench line. The 4th Company proceeds south to do much the same on the eastern side of Mount Kozna, and the 1st Company proceeds straight due east basically to just further push the front line forward. Anyway, continuing here. <clears throat> we rushed downhill as fast as our legs would take us. Howitzer shells were striking in the draw, and our heavy machine gun fire still covered the enemy, who was pressing back into his positions through narrow passages in the wire. I was soon close on the enemy's heels with the forward units of my detachment. 
In the heat of battle, we did not worry about the German shells striking to the right, left, and rear. The enemy ahead of us was in headlong flight. He did not yet know how close we were to him, for no enemy shots hampered our advance. Many dead and wounded Romanians lay all about us. Our heavy machine guns shifted their fire to the left. We hurried through the obstacles and were soon within the hostile position. After a short rifle and hand grenade struggle, the garrison fled, and I quickly disposed the companies as they arrived. Quote, First company towards the east, fifth company towards the north, fourth company towards the south. Each company is to roll up the hostile positions for 160 yards and then halt and occupy and organize the position. Maintain active reconnaissance to your front. End quote. After a few minutes, I received word that all assigned objectives had been reached. On the right, in front of the fourth company, the Romanian garrison was, clo was most tenacious and even tried to regain its lost position by counter thrusts. But those were in vain, for the mountain troops did not surrender that which they had once taken. To the east and north, the Romanians were retreating, and even the artillery was evacuating into positions behind the ridge as rapidly as possible. The enemy was still holding out in the Madlung Group sector of Mount Kozna. Over on the right, the enemy had occupied his secondary positions and, following the failure of his counterattacks, limited his efforts to holding these positions at all costs. A large gap in the hostile defensive system was invisible in front and to our left. By throwing in all available reserves, we could have broken through with relative ease. Telephone communication with group headquarters had been established. My signal troops were marvelous and every bit as good as my assault troops. I quickly informed group command as to the situation up forward and requested the dispatch of all available reserves and the secession of artillery fire on the second hostile position in the Sprosser sector. I learned that the hostile position on Mount Kozna to the right of Madlung's group had not at this time been taken. The immediate dispatch of Gosler's detachment and the 1st Battalion, 18th Infantry, was promised. I had to make most effective use of my available forces and could not overlook the possibility of counterattacks coming from Mount Kozna or from the south. The engineer platoon was given the job of improving the 4th Company's sector, and the latter extended its front to the east as far as a small wooded knoll from which a heavy machine gun platoon began to fire on hostile batteries near Nicoresti, a distance of 2,800 yards, with the result that the batteries hitched up and evacuated their positions at the gallop. To the east, scout squads of the 1st Company were hard on the heels of the enemy, retreating downhill and through the light woods. To the north, the Army Assault Detachment was rolling up the hostile positions beyond the line reached by the 5th Company. It moved forward rapidly. In the same direction, and within two miles striking distance, was Turgul Okna. The town itself was under heavy artillery fire, and we could see endless columns of vehicles halted near equally long trains in the situation, pardon me, in the station. We could have reached the town within 30 minutes, thereby cutting off the valley from which a large portion of the Romanian forces drew their supplies. Presuming that town still exists, I'll try and see if I can pull up a Google Maps sort of image of the train in the present day if I can. Continuing here. Impatiently, I awaited the arrival of Gosler's detachment and the 1st Battalion, 18th Infantry. According to information from group headquarters, both had been on their way for a long while. Minutes ticked by slowly, but no one arrived and we could hear the sounds of combat to our right rear where the possession of Mount Kozna was still being contested. Our, one, our captures had reached 500 men and several dozen Romanian machine guns. More than two hours had passed since the successful attack on the second position, and the Romanians in the north were recovering from their fright and beginning to drive the assault detachments back. At the same time, Romanian artillery batteries in the region of Satul Noi fired some hundred rounds at the 4th Company but most of them were quote-unquote overs and exploded harmlessly on the north slope of Mount Kozna. 
The enemy in the south did not counterattack, but his lively machine gun fire forced us to use care in the forward positions and communication trenches. Sporadic hand grenade fighting flared up in the 4th Company's sector, but the enemy failed to gain any advantage from this. Gosler's detachment arrived at 1600 hours, in brackets, four and a half hours after our initial attack, closing bracket, and his arrival coincided with a strong Romanian counterattack from the north, which forced us to commit the 6th Company in the gap between the 1st and 5th Companies. An attack against the valley was out of the question without adequate reserves. The hostile attack from the north was repulsed after a hand-to-hand -hand fight. At 1830 hours, group headquarters reported that Madlung's group had taken Mount Kozna, in brackets the southern part, and was advancing east up the ravine to attack the secondary position. Shortly before dark, we observed the rearward movement of fairly strong Romanian infantry formations near Nicoresti and Satul Noi. At the same time, several successive trains pulled out of Tirgul Okna and headed in an easterly direction. We made contact with the 22nd Infantry Reserve Regiment, whose left had taken the Romanian positions on Hill 692. Hoping that we would break through to the plains on the following day, I put my detachment in an outpost line that extended well to the east and pushed my reconnaissance detachment as far as Nicoresti. In the north, a strong enemy still confronted the 6th and 5th companies. I was on my feet until midnight, taking care of provisions for the troops, replenishing ammunition, and preparing my combat report. Then I lay down to sleep in a tent with Captain Gosler. Observations The attack of August 19, 1917, against the fortified wire-protected Romanian positions lying half a mile apart, and it was different, a different kind of task for the Wertenberg Mountain Battalion. Each position was to be taken after an hour's bombardment. The mountain soldiers broke through both positions with few losses while the artillery bombardment of the first position was going on and smashed into the second position along a 700-yard front and captured over 500 Romanians, thus paving the way for a breakthrough to the east, for it was improbable that the Romanians had a third fortified and garrisoned portion in the lowlands east of Mount Kozna. Unfortunately, this great success could not be exploited because the reserves were too late in arriving and too weak in numbers. The terrain called for unusual tactics. After penetrating the hostile positions close below Mount Kozna's summit, we found it easy to break up the hostile positions on the steep descending northward slope, particularly as this attack could be supported by heavy machine gun fire from Russian Knoll. It was vital that the leading elements penetrate a maximum distance in a minimum time, and that there be no diversification of effort in smashing into the first positions. As a matter of fact, the forces were held together during the operations against the second line, such that we might have a maximum of strength in hand for further exploitation when the reserves finally arrived. The coordinated use of artillery, mortars, and heavy machine guns was the result of thorough prior planning. The mortar company nailed the enemy down at the breakthrough site even before, artillery, even before the artillery preparation and allowed Friedel's assault squad to cut a path through the wire. Artillery fire on the first position forced the enemy to cover during the breakthrough by the Rommel detachment, while a machine gun company and a platoon of the 5th Company fired on the enemy outside the breakthrough area and prevented him from interfering with operations. The intense German preparatory fire on the first hostile position forced the strong Romanian reserves to withdraw hurriedly to the second position. The Rommel detachment exploited the tactical situation and took up a vigorous pursuit and drove into the second hostile position, close behind the fleeing enemy, who was under heavy fire. In so doing, the mountain soldiers ran the risk of coming under their own artillery fire, which could not be shifted so quickly. Again on the defensive. At 0300 hours on August 20th, 
the enemy reopened the battle for the Mount Kozna Massif with violent artillery fire from numerous batteries. A large number of heavy shells struck in the vicinity of the command post and the reserve areas and forced us to vacate the endangered areas and take shelter in the draw half a mile north of the summit. The enemy fire increased steadily with its bulk directed at the position captured by us east of Mount Kozna, where the Romanians imagined us to be. It was ver I was very glad that I had only a few of my men dug in there, for the fire soon converted this position into a mass of rubble. At 0700 hours, the enemy began to advance against the deep outpost occupied by the first company, and the draw near Nicoresti began to fill with Romanians. The sixth company, which was in the north, reported that it could observe attack preparations on the part of the enemy in this sector. All doubt vanished and we began. We became convinced that the Romanians intended to regain the territory lost the previous day. It was high time to shift to the defense. A continuous line had to be formed in the rugged and wooded terrain, and the uncovered northern flank required particular protection. I decided not to occupy the old Romanian positions, for they had been under heavy fire all morning, and the Romanians had their range and knew their details most intimately. Defended, these positions would cost us too many casualties, in spite of the work involved and short time remaining before meeting this strong enemy, I preferred to move the forward slope position to the east and in the woods. I issued the necessary orders on the spot, and the companies dug in while the first company's outposts fought a delaying action. Digging was easy in the loamy soil, and the reserves helped the frontline units to dig their positions and their communication trenches so that all was in readiness when the combat outposts were finally driven into the positions. The initial assault was easily repulsed, and the Romanians began to dig in some 50 yards away from us. Romanian artillery tried to reach our forwardmost slope positions, but had to give up because of the danger of firing on its own troops. It therefore restricted itself to pounding the former Romanian positions up on the ridge, which were unoccupied, of course. I had few worries regarding the Eastern Front, in brackets, first and fourth companies, but the north and northwest sectors were a different story. For, they, for there, we had a huge gap in our defense. Our contact to the left, in brackets, 1st Battalion, 18th Bavarian Reserve Infantry Regiment, was along the northeast slope of Mount Kozna, on the ridge leading from Hill 491 to the summit, and the Romanians took advantage of the draw and climbed up and reached the rear of our position. The third company, hitherto in reserve, had to close the gap between the left flank of the 5th Company and the 1st Battalion of the 18th. It held in spite of a numerically superior enemy, poor defensive terrain, and miserable visibility. The battle increased hourly in violence, and during the day the enemy launched at least 20 assaults against us. Some of them were preceded by a short artillery preparation, and some were not. The Romanian front was a semicircle about us, and we had to rush our few reserves from one threatened point to another. The hostile artillery fire tore up the ridge, but the mountain troops did not waver. Our losses were small in proportion to the enemy's. We had a total of 20, loss, uh, 20 casualties. I was so exhausted, probably because of the exciting activities of the previous days, that I could give orders only from a lying position. In the afternoon, because of a high fever, I began to babble the silliest of nonsense, and this convinced me that I was no longer capable of exercising command. In the evening, I turned the command over to Captain Gosler and discussed the situation with him. After dark, I walked down the ridge road across Mount Kozna back to the group command post, a quarter of a mile southwest of Headquarters Knoll. The Wartenberg Mountain Battalion held its position against all the Romanian attacks until October 25th, pardon me, until August 25th, when it was relieved by the 11th Reserve Infantry Regiment and moved behind the front into Division Reserve. The battles for Mount Kozna exacted a terrific toll from the young troops. 
we had 500 casualties inside of two weeks and 70 and 60 brave mountain soldiers lay in Romanian soil. In spite of the fact that the major mission was not achieved and that we failed to destroy the enemy's southern flank, yet the mountain troops executed every assigned mission in a masterful way in the face of a hard-fighting, tenacious, and well-equipped enemy force. I still look back on the days as commander of such troops with intense pride and joy. After the arduous days on Mount Kozna, a few weeks' leave spent on the shores of the Baltic Sea restored me to tip-top form. <clears throat> Observations In the defense on August 20th, 1917, the main line of resistance was shifted to densely wooded terrain on the forward slope in order to nullify the anticipated action of the Romanian artillery. This was completely justified, for in the course of the fighting, the enemy did not succeed in covering this concealed main battle line with artillery fire. The main defense positions were being prepared while the combat outposts withdrew fighting and the reserve companies were employed to dig well-concealed communication trenches for the forward line. These trenches proved to be important for moving supplies of all kinds and evacuating the wounded under fire without losses, or at least with only slight losses. Afterward, the reserves dug themselves in at designated locations. The defensive fighting on August 20th required using the reserves at the frequently changing danger spots. Where danger threatened, the reserves had to occupy the main battlefield in depth. Reinforcing the front line proper with reserves was avoided as far as possible. And with that, we conclude Chapter 4. Chapter 5, the Ptolemyan Offensive, 1917, will be enclosed in the following video of this series. Now, regrettably, I have to admit, it's been nearly a month, possibly more, since I published the previous chapter, and I do apologize for the delay. Naturally, I do have a busy life and a busy schedule, but I make do where I can. Um, other things that I wish to mention before ending this recording... I've taken the liberty of looking up the various locations mentioned in this particular chapter, and I am going to try, if I can, to place down in the video portion of this various maps denoting where these battles happened and other key sort of landmarks mentioned within the text for the purposes of making reference relative to what that territory and territory looks like in the present day and under the current political climate. So, if that interests you, you're welcome. In any case, I'm probably going to try and read the next chapter of this within roughly a month as well, maybe a few weeks, we'll see. But I do hope you enjoyed it, and I do hope you do stick with us. So without further ado, thank you for joining us, and have a wonderful evening. Auf Wiedersehen. Infantry Attacks was originally published as Infantry Gereft Anne and was written by Field Marshal Erwin Rommel. The voiced lines for this audiobook edition were recorded by Daniel Howard Hurt. Thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful evening. Good night.